So I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff in this talk that relates to my research. Um, I mean, I don't know. I made this thing here, and then last, yesterday when I was trying to figure out how I'm going to get to all of that stuff that I mentioned there, uh, it turns out that we're going to go through a ridiculous number of ideas in this one hour. Um, so like some of the greatest ideas in theoretical physics in the last hundred years, uh, we're, we're going to get to like most of my favorite ones and then kind of see how they're all tied together. And so I should just get started. And so the general theme of the talk is going to be like, how do we understand the universe? Um, eventually we're gonna get to cosmology and the big bang and how to understand that. Um, and so I guess I have to start somewhere and I chose to start in around 1921, I think it was, or no, 19, yeah, 1915 to 1920, Einstein was coming up with what we now consider to be like the best theory of gravitational physics that we, that we have. Uh, and so that is the theory of general relativity. And so that's my first major topic. And I'm going to be going through things very, very quickly. So I've selected only what I think are the very most important core ideas in each of these things. And so when we're talking about general relativity, what are we talking about? So Einstein came up with a new understanding of how gravity works that replaced Newton's F equals GMM over R squared force law and said, actually, gravity isn't really a force at all like the other forces. Um, you understand gravity in a totally different way. And that is to think about geometry, geometry of space, and how that could actually change in response to there being energy and matter in the space. And so you've probably all seen this cartoon that if you have, if we kind of try to visualize space, well, it's easier for us to visualize two-dimensional space. And so that's why we're drawing this 2D picture. So it's kind of like you imagine a flat piece of paper. And then if there's some mass localized in some region, then that has the effect of actually warping the space into a different geometry. And so now it's a curved space. And then the way that we explain things like the moon orbiting around the earth in a curved path is that actually the moon is just trying to go in the natural path that it would go. Um, so if the, the space weren't curved, it would just go in a straight line in a constant velocity. But because now the earth curves the space, if the moon tries to go in like a straight path, so if, you, if you're on the surface of the earth and you try to go in a straight path, you eventually come back to yourself. You go around in a circle because the space that you're walking on is curved. And so that's kind of the idea with how do we explain the orbits of planets and the effects of gravity and general relativity, the mass, the energy that's in the space, it curves the space. Um, it also curves time, but we, it really curves space time together, but we won't need to get into that. Um, and then, objects just move in the natural way that they would in that curved geometry. There's a set of equations. So Einstein's equations, some of the most important equations in physics, they basically tell you how matter and energy curve space. And so, so one side of Einstein's equations tells you how much energy, matter, momentum you have in a region. And then the other side of Einstein's equations are a geometrical quantity that tells you how much curvature there is there. And then Einstein's equation says that basically those two things are equal to each other. And so that mathematically captures the idea that energy, mass, momentum, all of these things will occur in space in a very particular way. And then once you've figured out how it's all curved, then you, look, you can look at the motion um, of stuff in that curved space using sort of a generalization of just Newton's first law. Okay. So you never actually need to really talk about forces. It's just Newton's first law, but in the curved space. Okay, um, here's a little example of you know, stuff that Einstein's equations predict. Um, so one cool thing is that because we're talking about space as not just being a background, as being more of a physical thing that could actually change 
with time, then you could actually have something like a ripple in space that without any matter around, it can propagate through space like a wave. And so that was one of the most exciting things in the last 10 years in physics is that we've directly observed these waves of space. Uh, we can kind of tell that a wave of space time has come by by noticing that the distances between objects get shorter and larger and shorter and larger. Uh, and so we can me measure that with a very sensitive uh, device called an inter interferometer that measures changes in distances. Okay, so the, the LIGO experiment um, in 2015, I believe, was the first one to actually make that observation of these gravitational waves that resulted from the merger of two black holes one and a half billion years ago. So very interesting. Um, so gravitational waves, ripples in space-time, it's like one exciting prediction of general relativity that you just absolutely don't have in Newton's theory of gravity. A couple of other really exciting predictions of general relativity is that sometimes you can have a situation where an object will collapse because the space becomes so curved, then all the particles in the object, they end up wanting to go into the middle. Um, and there's a certain situation where once a star that's large enough uh, ends up using all its nuclear fuel up, um, then it will end up collapsing. And according to Einstein's equations, if you just solve them and see what happens, um, you run into a problem because it says that that matter just keeps collapsing forever until it's infinitely dense and the space is infinitely curved. And then we don't really know. Um, so the, the math just tells you that a bunch of things become infinity. And then we don't really know what, what that means. And so we think that's a situation where you have to go beyond Einstein's equations and include a better theory. Um, and we're going to talk about what that might be. Okay. Um, so that's black holes. Another super interesting prediction of general relativity is that you can't have a universe filled with stuff that just sits there um, because space itself is dynamical and it will feel all of the matter that's filling the universe. And so something that people realized very early on is that the only cons if you see a universe filled with stuff, there's two possibilities. One is that it could be like expanding uniformly, but sort of slowing down as all of the matter and radiation uh, gravitate on the space time. Or you can have a situation where the space time is already collapsing and then co generally continues collapsing. Okay. So those are the consistent solutions. And so it was bizarre at first. Uh, Einstein kind of rejected that whole idea that space would be expanding, like the entire universe would be expanding as a whole, but then not very long after that, you know, within a couple of decades, people were actually making astronomical observations and they noticed if they looked really far away at really distant galaxies that they all appear to be receding from us and they appear to be receding from us faster the further they are away. And so it was like entirely consistent with the idea that in fact the universe is expanding. Okay. And so, um, so that's very interesting that the universe as a whole has this dynamics. And one of the most interesting parts of that is if you go back to the beginning, so you try to run Einstein's equations in reverse, then it tells you that about 14 billion years ago, there was a point where it seems like everything would have been infinitely dense as you go backwards, as everything came closer and closer um, and so that's another big mystery. Uh, we, we have a fancy name for it, the Big Bang. Um, but again, it's a place where if you have Einstein's theory of gravity, like just a bunch of stuff becomes infinity and you don't really have a good physical interpretation for that. Um, and so some of us um, in theoretical physics are trying to ask, okay, how do we improve on Einstein's theory of general relativity in order to be able to deal with these situations like the inside of a black hole or situations like the Big Bang, where the Einstein's theory just tells you that a bunch of stuff that you're interested in goes to infinity. 
And so the way that we think you need to improve on Einstein's theory is to include another really important part of physics, uh, which is quantum mechanics. And so just to, to tie that to this a little bit, um, when I say quantum mechanics, you probably think of atoms, molecules, like orbitals, stuff like that. We usually deal with quantum mechanics when we're talking about really short distance scale physics. Okay, so that is mostly when quantum mechanics is important. And it's just true, this is something that people realized in the 20th century, that just trying to do physics with ordinary Newton's laws, uh, it doesn't work uh, if you try to understand like the physics of atoms and molecules. You would make predictions about how, if you had an electron near a proton, it might start orbiting for a while, but then it would produce electromagnetic radiation that would carry away all of the energy in 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So if you try to just use classical physics to understand a hydrogen atom, you would predict that the electron will just spiral into the proton in one tenth of one billionth of one second. And so all, all matter like in the universe would cease to exist in, in a nanosecond in, in the usual way. So there's major, major problems if you believe that you could just do Newton's laws um, and ordinary uh, classical physics at that scale. And so people realized over like the first half of the 20th century that what you need to do is completely change uh, how, you, how you think about physics at that scale. Um, before I tell you how you have to completely change how you think about physics, just to connect with like, why is that the answer to understanding black holes and the big bang? Well, so imagine if you had matter that becomes denser and denser and denser and denser. Um, at some point, gravity is gonna be important at those tiny distance scales. Okay, so if you had a hydrogen atom and then you thought about like making the, the proton and the electron just way, way, way more dense so that now the proton is the mass of the sun and the electron is the mass of the earth. Okay, then obviously gravity would be important there um, and, and so we'd be talking about a situation where gra gravity is important. So we have these huge densities. Gravity would be important at these tiny distance scales where you also think quantum mechanics would be important. Okay. So that's kind of why we need to answer the questions about black holes and about the big bang. We obviously need to think about gravity because there's huge densities of mass that are curving space time. We also need to think about quantum mechanics because those gravitational effects are happening even at these tiny atomic distance scales. Okay, I'm gonna breathe. And then we'll go on to part two. Um, so I'm gonna now tell you a little bit about quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so you hear a lot about quantum mechanics. I'm gonna tell you the very most important thing that you need to know about quantum mechanics and why quantum mechanics is different than classical physics. So it goes back to the very starting point. When you start dealing with classical physics, then basically the first thing you do is you say that an object has a certain configuration at a given time, and we describe that configuration by some coordinates. If it's just moving in one dimension, we only need to introduce one coordinate. And then we introduce this mathematical description of the object to say that at any time, there's some X location of the object. And it could be at two centimeters, or it could be at four centimeters. And then we have rules in physics that help us predict if it's at two centimeters initially, and maybe it has some velocity, then we can make a prediction where it will be later. And that will depend on what are the forces on the object. And we use Newton's laws, and we do all this math. Okay. So quantum mechanics, um, it changes the story right from the very beginning. And the way that it changes the story is to say that if you can have an object at this location, say two centimeters, and you can have the object at a different location, say four centimeters, um, then there are these other states that an object could be in that we call quantum superposition states 
that are something like it's half in this configuration and half in this configuration. Okay. So I've tried to represent that here. My object is this happy face. In this case, the happy face has a definite location at two centimeters. In this case, it has a definite location at four centimeters. In this case, it's just still a single object, but it doesn't have a definite location. And so we would call it a 50-50 superposition state. And we don't encounter these things a lot. We're not used to this in the macroscopic world. Like you don't come into your room and your pillow's like half on one side of the bed and half on the other side of the bed. It's like here or it's here. Like in our experience, this is not, this is something we never observe. Um, and so part of the reason is that with these quantum states, when you do have something like an electron that is in a superposition state, okay, um, often once it interacts <clears throat> with its environment, um, that can kind of force it into a different state that would more likely be something like this or something like this. Sometimes we describe this as saying that if you were to observe an object in one of these superposition states, then it will it will like quickly change, it will collapse into either this or this. And so the way you interpret the superposition state is that that's how it was before you disturbed it. It's in like a combination of these possibilities and then if you go in and interact with it and observe it, then it will be here or it will be here. Okay. And the, the fact that it's a 50-50 superposition would mean that there's a 50-50 chance that it'll be this or this after you observe it. Um, so there are more general superpositions. You could also have the same two possibilities, but with a 70%, 30% superposition. So that would be another valid quantum state of this happy face. But because there are actually really a lot of possible positions for an object, well, really a kind of an infinite number, um, the most general states of objects in quantum physics, they be very complicated superpositions um, between lots of different locations. And so in order to describe that, in order to say, what is the state of the happy face at some instant in time, you kind of have to give like the, so instead of 50-50 or 70-30, you have to give like a number, a probability for every possible location. And so when you're giving a, a number for a whole set of locations, well, mathematically, that's a function, right? A function is where you specify a number for all the different possible locations. And in quantum mechanics, this function is what we call the wave function. So that's the right way to think about what a wave function is. It's a thing that describes a quantum superposition, okay, which is the most general state of like a general object. Um, it's going to not have a definite location. It will have a lot of possible locations to describe the state. You need to say what's the likelihood of you finding it in all those possible locations. And so that's what a wave function does for you. All right, so that's the most, like this quantum superposition idea is the most crucial difference between ordinary physics and quantum physics. Um, so that's even before we talk about the actual evolution of things, even before we do the analog of Newton's laws, this is just how you describe systems. And so instead of describing them with coordinates, you describe them with like wave functions of coordinates. Then you can do all the rest of the physics. Um, so instead of Newton's second law, which you could use to make predictions about the future motion of a particle, if you know the forces on the particle. So there's a version of that. You can say, okay, what do we have to do to Newton's second law to translate it to now these wave functions evolving with time? And so that's the thing that we call the Schrodinger equation um, that you've probably heard of even if you haven't taken quantum mechanics. So there is a version of Newton's second law. And then the input for that would be a wave function at one time. The output for that would be a wave function at some other time. Um, wave functions often tend to spread out. So that's what I'm showing here. Uh, sometimes you'll hear about quantum uncertainty 
and and so that's basically just how spread out is your wave function that's related to the uncertainty in in the position. This one has less uncertainty. Um, this one has more uncertainty. Okay, I couldn't resist. I mean, this is not important for the rest of the talk, but I couldn't resist just like mentioning this from a philosophical standpoint, this replacement of things having definite locations all the time with just being in superposition states. Um, it's really important sort of philosophically in that it, it gets rid of this determinism idea. So in classical physics, if you knew exactly the configuration of everything at one time, like all the molecules in your brain, um, then you should just be able to use some classical physics equations and they would tell you exactly what all the molecules in your brain would be doing at a later time. And so that means that you should be able to like predict everything that you're going to do in the future um, if, if you knew all, all of the stuff at the present that's going on in your head. Um, and so that's disturbing, like the fact that you wouldn't actually have any control about what you do two days from now, um, because it's all just sort of Newton's laws and and uh, it's just, you're just governed by physics. Um, in quantum mechanics, there's at least a possibility because all you can predict in quantum mechanics would be probabilities for outcomes. And so if you know everything you can know about the current configuration of your brain, then if you did quantum mechanics, then what you could possibly predict in, is that in two days that there's like all these possibilities for what this, the state of you would be. Um, and that's as far as physics can go. And so there's like still room for saying, okay, but, but then, you know, we don't know like the actual thing that you're gonna do, I guess it has to be one of those, but we don't really understand um, like beyond that, uh, what determines the actual thing that you do. So it's kind of cool that there's like still some room for like free will or, or some, some non-deterministic uh, viewpoint of the world. I could take questions as we go through, but maybe we'll just keep keep moving along. If anyone, if anyone has like an urgent question at any time, then you could put up your hands. Um, there's six major ideas. We've got through two of them, and so I think we're I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay, so we talked about general relativity, energy and matter for space, and then those same objects will then respond to the curvature of space. That's how we understand gravity. There are some major puzzles with the theory of general relativity. We don't really understand the physics of black holes once, once things collapse um, beyond a certain point. Um, we don't really understand the Big Bang. Um, we think that in order to understand those things, those are, those are situations where gravity is important, even at microscopic atomic distance scales. And so we think that you need to somehow combine gravity with this other theory of quantum mechanics. Okay. And so, so people have been trying to do quantum gravity, uh, well, for, for like 50 years, more than 50 years, um, people have been trying to do that. And people were really successful. They like combined quantum mechanics with electromagnetism and they got quantum electromagnetism and they combined quantum mechanics with like some extension of electromagnetism to get what we call the standard model of particle physics. So we understand the weak force and the strong force with quantum mechanics combined with regular, uh, regular physics. And somehow combining quantum mechanics with gravity or with general relativity uh, ended up just being a lot harder. And it seemed to be just somehow fundamentally different and so for many years, we didn't really have any, any mathematically consistent theory of quantum gravity, of like a theory with gravity in it and with quantum mechanics in it that like just made sense uh, in itself. And so string theory was like one approach to try to, with this, to, try to combine gravity and quantum mechanics. But again, for a long time, even string theory, it, we, we didn't have the full set of rules for, for what that theory was. 
And that was true until about 1997, um, which happened to be about like the time that I was getting into research and theoretical physics. And so in 1997, people in the string theory community for the first time were able to write down a model of quantum gravity um, where they could at least in principle ask any question and answer it. And, and so where they had a hope of understanding some of these puzzles about black holes and singularities and the big bang, okay. So that approach to quantum gravity is still basically our only totally consistent theory that we're kind of sure exists. Um, it is known as holography. And the reason that it's known as holography um, is that it works a little bit like a hologram. Okay, so it's totally bizarre. It's a, it's a totally bizarre, shocking idea. Um, and okay, so roughly the idea is that holography says that like space isn't real or like the, the three-dimensional world that we live in is not as real as we think. Uh, but let me explain it in a more uh, down-to-earth way. Okay. okay, so what does holography say? Holography tells you to um, imagine a, so we're trying to understand our universe, 3D space with gravity and quantum mechanics. Um, holography says, okay, that's like, imagine something simpler. Let's start with something much simpler. Instead of a 3D universe, think of a 2D universe. Okay, so like, this is the universe I want you to imagine. It's just the surface of this sphere. Okay, so it's just like a two-dimensional object. There's nothing inside the sphere or outside. The sphere is the whole universe. Um, this universe also has no gravity. It's just more or less like an ordinary physical system, like a ball of copper, like a really thin shell of copper or lead or something else. Okay. Um, probably you should envision some, some kind of exotic material that doesn't actually exist in our universe. Um, but its properties are similar. So, you know, it's, it can have ripples in the surface. It could like sound waves. It could have, it could be hotter some places, colder other places. You could add energy to it. It's a very conventional kind of system. And we can write down the physics of that. We can write down some Schrodinger equation that explains how the wave functions for that system evolves. Uh, we can understand it very well. Okay, so holography says that for, for certain systems like that, these very, these special materials that we can imagine, um, the physical states of this two-dimensional boring uh, shell of material, they would encode the physics of a 3D universe. Okay, so, so this guy could exist in various possible states. I'll give you some examples. So it might be like the simplest thing would be to just chill it right down to absolute zero. So it's in its lowest energy configuration. Okay. And then somehow the quantum state of that thing at absolute zero. So that would encode a big empty space time. Okay. So just nothing in it, empty space. Um, I'm going to tell you what I mean by encode in a bit. Um, but you can consider different states of this material. Okay, so you could like give it a little wax with a little hammer, and then there'd be some ripples going through. And so then that quantum state would somehow carry the information about a different space time that might have some gravitational waves going through. Okay, so this is a 3D space with gravity. This is just 2D physics without gravity. Um, you could do something more extreme. You could, you could take your thing and then heat it up to some high temperature. And so, so now it's like a, a very warm ball of copper or lead. And according to this dictionary, um, the kind of state that that would encode is something where you would have a space time and then like lots of energy in the space time. And what happens when you put lots of energy in the space time is that stuff would form a big black hole. So in this holography picture, you have thermal states, of uh, high temperature states of your 2D thing, and that encodes some black hole living in the space time. Okay, so there's this weird connection 
in this holographic picture between the physics of thermodynamics and the physics of black holes in, in gravity. Um, and then you could have, yeah, you could have something more complicated where you have some of these ripples and some energy here and some energy here, and then that would somehow encode the physics of you know, maybe some black holes and some gravitational waves and some stars and some planets. Okay. Okay, so this is the way that it works. And... And so when, we, when we're talking about holographic models of quantum gravity, what that means is that you write down some equations that describe this quantum system. Okay, so you'd write down um, some type of quantum equation, something like a Schrodinger equation that tells you how the wave function of that spherical system would evolve with time. Okay, And then you also describe sort of like a dictionary that tells you how to interpret all of this in some kind of gravitational language. Um, let me give you like a down to earth example of something where one physical system is encoding another kind of physical system. Okay, So if you're playing Minecraft, then there's like a 3D universe that you're going around in and you drop some stuff and it falls, right? And and so there's some kind of rules of physics in Minecraft, and it seems, I mean, it's not exactly like uh, the physics in our universe, okay? But it is, it is sort of like a 3D universe where, where there are rules. Um, and, and if we say, okay, well, what's like, what really is Minecraft? Um, what, what is behind it physically? Well, then actually there's like, just in your computer, there's some computer chip. There's like a memory chip in your computer which you might imagine as being some two-dimensional array of little electronic components, these bits that could be on or off, okay? And so what Minecraft really is in some sense is just like different states of this two-dimensional system that are changing with time. And then there's some kind of a dictionary that tells you how, tells the computer how to interpret all the states of the qubits in terms of like the 3D visual representation of Minecraft, okay? So, so you're totally used, like this isn't not, not something that you've never seen before. The idea that one physical system could encode the physics of the other physical system um, is, is actually very familiar. Um, it's just a bit weird if I'm telling you that our system is like the Minecraft system and there's something more fundamental like the computer chip that would be actually the real place where the physical equations are are happening and, um, and and the quantum mechanics is happening. Okay, but but that is that is the thing we're supposed to think. That is what the holographic picture of quantum gravity says. It says that the three D physics that we experience is actually some kind of manifestation of some simpler physics of a two D universe um, that is much simpler because it doesn't have gravity. The two D universe is fully quantum mechanical, and so like that understanding of, of the quantum mechanics carries over to the fact that there's some quantum mechanics in the gravity universe as well. And so that's the way that we would do, if I, if I had a quantum gravity question that I wanna ask, then the, the way I use holography, I translate that question to a question about the quantum mechanics of the simpler system, then I solve the thing, and then I translate the answer back and I learn about the quantum gravity. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um so so at least that is the that the understanding that the complete physics of this 3D gravitational universe would somehow be encoded in this in this 2D universe. And actually, this gets back to something when I said you, you should imagine like a really exotic sort of material. Um, so, so something like copper or lead, it's just not complicated enough to encode the physics of, of like the higher dimensional universe. So you need the, the models that we actually work with, and there are actual equations, like this isn't just a, a, an idea that we talk about. There are equations that exactly describe this, this kind of system. 
Um, and so in these systems, you, you have, uh, like we would say, it's a lot of degrees of freedom. It's, it's a, a very, it's a material that's very much more complicated than copper or lead or any standard material that we would have here on Earth. Okay. All right, so the next thing I wanna do, I wanna tell you more about this dictionary. How, did, how is the space-time geometry really encoded in this simpler quantum mechanical system? Okay. Um, and so that brings us to the fourth really important idea. And that idea is the idea of quantum entanglement. Okay, so this carries forward from our idea of quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanics is about there being superposition states. So quantum entanglement is just a very simple extension of that idea, um, but a very useful one. Quantum entanglement is one of the things that we believe uh, is behind the fact that quantum computers can conceivably do things that no classical computer can do. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, okay, so what is quantum entanglement? Instead of imagining that happy face ball that can exist at one of any infinite number of positions, I want you to imagine a simpler kind of system that can only exist in one of two states. Um, so in, in classical physics, we would sometimes call this a bit, like in your computer, you have some little electronic component that could exist in an on state or an off state. Um, and so, uh, so another example would be like the outcome of a coin flip. The coin could be heads or tails and we never really find it on the side. Um, there's lots of physical systems that we can imagine um, where they're only likely to be ever in one of two states. And so the reason it's nice to imagine those is that it's then a lot simpler to talk about the quantum mechanics of those systems. Okay? Because now if you have a bit and it can only have one of two states, then I could actually describe pretty easily like all the possible quantum states of the bit as well. And so the classical bit could be on or off. Um, the quantum bit, it could be on or off or it could be 50-50 on, off, or it could be 30 on, 70 off. So there are all these superpositions, okay. So to talk about entanglement, then we're just now going to move to a slightly more complicated situation where we have a system with two parts, okay. Your computer has like, I don't know, trillions of bits, billions, trillions sometimes of these bits. Let's just think about two of them. Um, so if you have two bits, two coins or, or two little computer bits, they could be both off, one on, one off, the other one on, the other one off, both on. And so there'd be four possibilities. But then once you start thinking about the quantum physics of that, um, now it's it gets even more complicated because basically you have to assign a probability to each one of those four things. Okay, so, so to say what is the state of these two bits, instead of four possibilities, you have to give like four, like these four real numbers. So it's almost like some infinite four dimensional space of possibilities for what is the state of your, your pair of bits. Okay. Um, part of why quantum computers can we believe they could do more things than classical computers is it's just this huge amount of information um, that a state of like just two qubits is a lot of information to say what is the state of two, two qubits. I mean, instead of you, you have to give like four real numbers and then if you had n qubits, you would have to give two to the power n numbers to say what the state of those qubits is. Anyways, it, there's a lot more information stored in the quantum state, because there are so many more possibilities uh, compared with the classical state, but we don't we don't really need to go there for this. We're going to stick with thinking about two qubits, and so what I want to do is just tell you about what is quantum entanglement. 
So we have our two qubits. And I want you to consider a very particular state where it's a quantum superposition. And there are two possibilities. One possibility is that if you were to go in and measure this thing and look, what's the state of it? You would either find them both off or you would find them both on. Okay, so that's my state. It's, it's a superposition state of both off 50% and both on 50%. Okay. And so what you notice about that state, if I said, okay, what's the state of the first qubit? Well, we don't know, it could be off or on, equally likely. The state of the second qubit also off, on, equally likely. But what's special about this state is that the state of the first qubit, if you were to look at that one, then you would instantly know what the state of the second qubit is. Um, there's no probability that you'll find off and then on, or on and then off. Okay, And so we say these two qubits in this quantum state are entangled with each other because their state is correlated. In the superposition, the two states are correlated. Okay, so it's either they're, they're the same, they're either both off or both on. Okay, so that's that's an entangled state when knowing when a, like a measurement of the first qubit would tell you about what the second qubit is, even though from the start they're both equally likely. Um, so so we say that's that's correlated. That's they have this quantum correlation, and so we say those two things are entangled. I'm gonna go going forward in this talk. I'm gonna represent that. Instead of drawing out this whole superposition, I'll, write a, I'll draw a little green line to indicate when you have two qubits and they're entangled with each other. Um, let me do this one. So here's the state of four qubits. It's a 50% superposition of this and this. Okay. And so in this one, what you notice is that the second qubit is always off. The fourth qubit is always on. Um, and so if you were to just look at the fourth qubit, it wouldn't really tell you anything about any of the other ones. But the first and the third qubit, they, they are indefinite. They don't have a definite state. They could be off, could be on, but they're the same. Okay. And so I would represent this superposition of qubits by, I could represent by drawing a line here. Okay. So this is like not telling you everything about the quantum state, but it's telling you that in the quantum state, there's a correlation between this one and this one. Okay, and so this is something that applies to just general quantum systems with many parts. Okay. We could have we could have a situation where you have a lot of qubits, and so, so a quantum computer chip is just a lot of these qubits. Currently, all we can do is make a quantum computer chip with like 50 of the qubits or, or getting close to 100 maybe of the qubits. And so you could take the state of a quantum computer chip and someone could then draw like a bunch of lines to show how the different qubits are entangled with other parts. Okay, so it's just a, some representation about some of the information of the quantum state, not all of the information, um, but an important part. All right, so that brings us to part five which is called space-time from entanglement. And so it turns out that this notion of entanglement is really crucial in answering this question about how do holographic systems encode space-time geometries. Okay, so that was, that was like, I just said somehow the information about the, about this space-time was encoded in, in this, and I said that was maybe something like how Minecraft universe is encoded in a computer chip, okay? So this holography actually, it's a bit like that, but it's a quantum computer chip. Um, and so, so to introduce this idea, like, let's forget about gravity, forget about space-time. Do some art here. So my art is, we have a bunch of bits and they're arranged in a circle, okay, because I didn't want to draw a little two-dimensional sphere of them, but so we have a bunch of bits arranged in a circle. And now we imagine that those are all these quantum bits and they're in some kind of quantum state of the whole thing. And some of them are going to be entangled with other ones. 
And we're going to draw a little green line between all of the two bits that are entangled with each other bit. Okay, so I, I've drawn all the green lines showing all the various entanglements. Okay. And okay, what you notice is that in my picture, we started with sort of a circle, which is like a one dimensional thing. And then by drawing all these entanglement lines, we kind of filled out like a two-dimensional geometry in a sense. Like if these were actual threads and we connected the things with little threads and you know, it'd be like weaving together a sheet, okay, some kind of fabric um, that would be made of these lines of entanglement. Okay. Actually, mathematically, there's there's a way to make this precise mathematically that I if I want to represent the way that the different parts of the system are entangled with each other, um, there's a mathematical representation of that information that is like a two-dimensional geometry. If we start with like a two-dimensional space of things, then the threads would all like kind of go all through the middle and they would fill out the whole space inside. And so the mathematical way to represent the pattern of entanglement, if we start with a two-dimensional thing, would be some kind of three-dimensional geometry. So there's actually like a, a 3D geometry that represents just the quantum entanglement when you have a set of things living in a 2D sphere. All right, so here's a, a mind-blowing fact then. Um, you can show that if you start with the right kind of quantum states, so the right kind of quantum, right pattern of entanglement, um, you can show that this entanglement geometry, this 3D geometry that is just capturing the entanglement features of a two-dimensional quantum system, that geometry satisfies Einstein's equations. Okay. Even though we, like in this discussion, there's no gravity. We have, like I talked about holography already, we're gonna connect with that. But here it's just like, if you're interested in studying entanglement, then you would use this 3D geometry to represent the entanglement in some way. Um, you would think that has nothing to do with gravity, but then you realize that Mathematically, the geometry that you come up with to represent the entanglement of the 2D system, it actually satisfies the same equations that gravitational space-time satisfy. Um, and so, so that leads to this like amazing thought that, okay, well, maybe then that's what our actual, that's how you should think of our actual Einstein's equations. Maybe our actual Einstein's equations are the same equations that are just describing features of the entanglement of some two-dimensional system that's invisible to us. And so this happened about, like about in the last 10 or 15 years, thinking about holography, it was then proposed that this is how holography works. Okay, that the, you start with a simple 2D thing, it's in some quantum state, and if you want to, decode what space-time geometry is that describing, what you need to do is look at how all the parts of that 2D thing are entangled with all the other parts. You represent that entanglement through this mathematical process of writing down an entanglement geometry. So you, there's like a 3D geometry that represents the entanglement at some time. Um, and then the, the claim is that that 3D geometry is the 3D geometry of the space of the space that this quantum system is encoding. Okay, and of course there's time as well. The entanglement can change with time, and so the geometry can change with time. Um, and so this is um, actually some research that I was involved in, like showing that you could derive the Einstein gravitational equations on this side. If you just start from stuff we know about entanglement and how entanglement changes with time. Okay. Um, so that seems to be the picture. Um, and it's like it's kind of awesome that like there's one fundamental set of equations in physics, the Einstein equations. Um, we didn't think they would like we wanted to come up with a quantum version of those. 
Um, but we didn't think the Einstein equations themselves had anything to do with quantum mechanics. And this is saying that actually, even those like classical equations or like even space itself, ordinary classical space, um, this is saying that that actually has something to do with quantum mechanics. That at a more fundamental level, there's a quantum system that would be underlying everything. And the entanglement in that quantum system is what's producing the space time that we live in. Um, and so sort of to highlight that, I've got this thought experiment that you could do. So, you know, we're living here in, in the space. Um, and then I'm saying that maybe there's some two-dimensional system somewhere, I don't know, in like someone's lab somewhere in a different universe, there's, there's these bits and they can control the quantum states of the bits. And then maybe one day they're in a bad mood and they decide to come into the lab and like change the quantum state so that all of these guys are no longer entangled with all of these guys. Okay, so they like apply some electric field or like do some manipulations in their lab to change the quantum state to like remove the entanglement between this side and this side in this 2D system. And then what we would experience would then be like our entire universe would start pinching apart and like split it into two parts. And if they decided to just get rid of all of the entanglement, um, and, and that would be like, they just go in and all of a sudden measure the state of every one of these qubits. So now each one is either up or down and it's not correlated with anything else. Um, if they were to do that, then the whole universe would just disappear and there wouldn't be any space left it's because uh, according to this picture, space is actually just like this entanglement structure of the underlying quantum system. And that brings us to part six um, of probably the most ambitious talk that I've ever tried to, to fit into an hour. Um, so what is this good for? Um, right, so, so we talked about how like, we wanted to get a better understanding of the quantum physics of gravity to understand black holes better and to understand cosmology and the Big Bang better. Um, there's actually been a lot of progress in the, in the last um, 25 years since holography was invented. We've understood a ton about black holes and the quantum physics of black holes. And I don't have time to tell you about any of that. What I want to tell you about is stuff that I've been focused on the last five years in my research, which is to try to use these holographic models of quantum gravity in order to understand the physics of cosmology. And so we could ask, like, what do we, you know, can we can we figure out how to make some configuration of this underlying quantum system where the gravitational space time would be like a an expanding universe with a big bang? And then if we can do that, like, what does that tell us about physics? Can we make any new predictions about the fate of the universe and so forth? Okay. Okay. So just to kind of remind you about cosmology. Um, our current picture is, spatially we think the universe is pretty flat, like maybe infinite, but it could just be like a giant sphere somehow. We don't really know what the full spatial geometry of the universe is, but as far as we could tell, it's like pretty okay to think about it as just a giant, like infinite 3D spatial universe. And then you kind of imagine that that's constantly being stretched out. Okay. So kind of like a rubber sheet, you put a bunch of dots on it that are like the stars and the galaxies, and then it's being pulled out in all directions. And so that's the, the picture of the expansion of space time that's been happening for the last 14 billion years. Um, mathematically, we describe that by a function of time. Um, you can imagine just picking your two favorite galaxies that are really far apart and then looking at how their distance from each other changes with time. And roughly that's how we think about this function. This is what we call the scale factor A. And so that is increasing with time. Um, one of the really interesting things that we learned in 1999 by observing supernova is that it's actually accelerating. So the second derivative of this thing is positive. Um, and there's a really, really simple equation um, for understanding how that changes. Okay, so general relativity is pretty complicated in general. 
But when you boil it down to understanding the evolution of the whole universe, you get something that, you know, it's, it's like as simple as the energy conservation equation for, for uh, an oscillator, a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so it says the time derivative of A squared, oh, divided by A squared, I forgot that. Um, and then it's just some stuff on the right-hand side, which is how much energy is in radiation, how much energy does it matter, and, and then there's this extra term here, which is how much energy is in dark energy. Um, these things here, this, this one over a cubed, it just means that as the universe expands, the matter gets diluted. And so this becomes, matter becomes less and less important for the evolution of the universe as the universe gets bigger. So that's how you understand this one over a. A gets bigger, matter becomes less important. Radiation becomes even less important um, because as the universe expands, the radiation gets diluted, but also it gets stretched out to longer wavelengths. And so its energy is even decreasing even faster. This guy here, dark energy, you hear that a lot. This is one of the big mysteries. We don't know what it is. We came up with this word to explain the fact that the universe seems to be accelerating. Um, neither of these things can make a universe accelerate. And so in order for a universe to accelerate, you need to have some energy in it that doesn't dilute as the universe expands. So we kind of think of it as just this, this basic energy density where the universe gets bigger. And now there's like, in a sense, more of that energy because the density stays constant uh, as the universe gets bigger. Okay. So that is a standard model of cosmology. The lambda CDM model assumes that this dark energy really just is a constant energy density and it doesn't change with time. And if you ask about in that model, what will happen in the future of the universe? Well, it'll just keep accelerating forever. And then all the stars will die and I don't know, it'll get boring and cold and that'll be it. Um, what happens when we try to come up with models of holography? So I've thought hard about how do you come up with models of holography, um, models of cosmology using this holographic approach to quantum gravity. And lots of other people have thought hard about this. And no one's been able to come up with this. No one's been able to like explain this in the context of holography. We can't seem to like reproduce just constant dark energy. It doesn't seem physically possible if we're building models from the ground up from quantum gravity. Um, and so what some of us have realized in the last few years is that you can still get models that have acceleration. So you can have models that would explain our current observations, but all of them that we've managed to come up with they all have this feature where the dark energy is actually not really uh, a constant. Um, the only way that we've been able to do it is to have something where the dark energy actually decreases with time and where eventually it will switch sign. And then instead of the universe accelerating, the universe will start decelerating and eventually start recollapsing. And then you'll end up with the whole universe crunching. Um, and so you might think of this as kind of a prediction of, of like our current understanding of how to do quantum gravity um, in that I don't know how to get any other kind of cosmology other than this. And so then you might say, well, maybe that's like what our actual universe is like. Um, and so I was kind of struck by this, um, you know, the, the fact that you're predicting that dark energy is decreasing with time and, and things will recollapse. The cool thing is that we'll be able to actually test this. Like people are doing observations to figure out if dark energy is constant or if it's changing with time. Um, and you can already use some data that exists. Okay, so I've like never in my life actually um, as a physicist taken a data set and then compared it with my theoretical models because I'm so far on the theory end. Um, but this thing about the decreasing dark energy inspired me and a student, Chris Waddell, to, um, to decide to like actually download the current best information about how this scale factor has been changing. Um, that data 
pass with you is looking at the brightness of supernova and their redshift. Um, people have been observing supernova in distant galaxies for many years. And we've got this big catalog of how bright is the supernova and how, how red is it, which tells us how fast the universe was expanding back when that thing exploded. Okay, so we took that information and we kind of took the, a model where you have decreasing dark energy, the, the kind of model that was coming out of our holographic models, and we wanted to see, um, you know, how well does it fit the data? Is it consistent to have a dark energy that's decreasing, or does the data basically say that the dark energy has been constant for all of the observations? Um, and so this is the result of that. Um, this is like the present value of the dark energy, and this is something to do with how quickly it's changing. And what we found was that actually most of the models that match the data well actually do seem to have a, a significant decrease in the amount of dark energy. Um, so going back to like half the age of the universe when the supernova, the, the most distant supernova were, um, were exploding that we've observed, um, during that time, so your typical model that matches the data well actually has had something like a 100% decrease in, in the dark energy. Um, so that was really exciting. It seems like maybe the kind of thing that the holographic models are suggesting, maybe that's actually what's happened in the history of our universe. Um, and so I'm really like excited to, to see what's coming out of like all these telescopes that they're sending up to figure out the time evolution of, of dark energy. Um, okay, and then this is my very last slide, um, which is not like even necessary, but in the abstract, I said something about wormholes and, and I haven't said anything about wormholes so far in the talk. Um, so I'll end with saying something about wormholes. Okay, so a cool feature of the mathematics of these holographic Big Bang, Big Crunch universes. Um, so in the theoretical model, the mathematical description that we have for all of this, um, a cool thing is that in this description, there actually is a sense that the imaginary values of time also make sense. Like we, we have time and we think of it as a real number that's going forward from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch. Um, but in these mathematical models, there's like, you can ask about, oh, what would happen at time i? What was our universe like at time three i or, other, or minus seven i? Um, and then there's an answer to that. Um, and so there's like this other time, this imaginary time direction. Um, and, and so then, then there's just like a, a geometry, which is different than our universe. It's instead of a big bang and a big crunch, it kind of expands outward from this recollapse point. Um, and so it's basically like this weird, enormous wormhole geometry. I've got a better picture um, that I got from the internet. Um, Okay, so this is like the actual geometry of our universe. And there's a big bang in, in this model where you have a big bang and a big crunch. Um, this is the actual geometry. And then this, we're gonna call this time zero. And this is like minus something, minus 14 or maybe 30 billion years and plus some time. And then over here, um, this would be what happens if you went in the imaginary time direction from here. And then it looks like this weird giant wormhole. And so, a fun thing is that like, if you want to study the predictions of this cosmology, then the actual math that you're doing is to, it's like much simpler to study the physics in, in this um, part of the imaginary time. And then you can, you can translate your results to the cosmology. So one of the things that we're doing now is like trying to understand what would be the predictions for the CMB based on like the, the microwave background and the structure in the universe based on these holographic models. Um, and so then the calculations we're doing for that <clears throat> would be to study physics in imaginary time in a giant wormhole. Um, so I think I'll end there. Okay. And and yeah, I'm I'm here like all afternoon for questions, but we can like feel free to leave or, or ask questions. Uh, yes. Yeah, maybe come for yeah, Janet or come. Yeah. 
Yeah, great, great question. Okay, so, so, um, I guess the first thing to say is that these holographic systems are really continuous. So it's really like a two-dimensional sphere with continuous space. And there's a way to talk about entanglement structure in that case as well, where you just look at a region of your two-dimensional space, and then you can assign um, a number to that region, which is how entangled is that region to the rest of the region. Um, so that's, that's sort of one answer to your question. Um, a separate answer to the question actually is that even if you have um, discrete things, so when we're talking about like the state of a qubit, and it could be on or off classically, but then quantum mechanically, you go from that discrete picture to something which is continuous. So, so the, the states of a qubit actually famously have a geometrical representation as like a sphere. Um, there's something called the block sphere, but we saw it as like the just the zero, zero, or zero, 100, 30, 70, 50, 50. If you think of all those possibilities, then there's kind of like a continuous set of possibilities for the state. And so if, if the information about the state captures the geometry, it's actually possible to start with a discrete set of things and um, and then get something continuous. So, yeah. I just have like two questions. So one of them is like, so is this really why like why like things like qubits are entangled and is it possible to hand, like force like two qubits to be entangled? But another question is that like it's like why did we choose a sphere as kind of like the holography and what would happen if we use a different like geometric shape? Yeah, okay, good question. So the first question is like, okay, why 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 are things entangled? Um and so usually it's just a question of so what does your physical system want to do to minimize its energy? Let me give you this like the simplest example of an entangled system, every hydrogen atom has a proton and a neutron, a proton and an electron. Um, the proton has a spin and the electron also has a spin, okay? And so those can be in different states. In the lowest energy state of a hydrogen atom, then the state of the proton spin is actually entangled with the state of the electron spin. Neither of them have a definite configuration. It's, it's like a 50-50 superposition of proton spin up, electron spin down, and proton spin down, electron spin up. Um, and so there it's just like the way that you minimize the energy in that hydrogen atom system is to have entanglement between the proton and the electron. And so it's the same in these holographic systems. If you just talk about the lowest energy configurations of those systems, then there's a lot of entanglement there already. Um, and this experiment where I was imagining removing all that entanglement, that actually costs you a lot of energy to do that. So yeah, so it's just like the natural state of a lot of quantum systems, you have a bunch of entanglements. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the, the other part? The other question is like, why did we choose a sphere as like the model? Oh yeah, yeah, why, why did we choose the sphere? Um, it, it doesn't really have to be a sphere. Um, in cosmology, it's often assumed that your universe has a certain amount of symmetry. Like we, we, we take that as a basic assumption in cosmology that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. And so, so our universe, it seems to have this rotational symmetry. And so you can kind of build that in um, by starting with a sphere, but you can also consider holography where you start with a different shape. I mean, it still works, but then your universe that you would be describing wouldn't be as symmetrical. So that's it. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I have a question. Oh yeah, here. please, yeah. So if you could go back a couple of slides, um, you had a grid, this one here. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if you could describe um, that again in terms of why um, dark energy would decrease. I just missed okay. that part. Yeah, thanks. So, so basically in our, in our model, we have, so I didn't go into the details of the model, um, but in the model, the reason dark energy is decreasing is that these models predict that there's some extra field in the universe. So we know about the electric field and the magnetic field. Um, and actually there's some other fields that we don't talk about as much. There's the Higgs field. Um, these models from holography predict that there should be some extra field like those things um, that's basically constant in space but which could depend on time. And 
there's a potential. So this, this field has a different potential energy depending on its value. And so we could e even write down the kind of potential that would be present. And it's actually very similar to the potential for the Higgs field if, if you know about that. And so the mathematics that describes the evolution of the dark energy, okay, so the dark energy is basically just the energy of this extra field. And so the mathematics that describes that, there's some equation for the evolution of the field. Um, okay, it's not, not important. Um, I'll write it down anyway. So, so there's some equation. Um, and, and what happens basically is that the field at the Big Bang, it starts out at a large value, and then it goes smaller, becomes negative, and, and then the universe starts to decelerate. And so when we're talking about this picture, so that would be looking at observations. So this would be maybe now, and this would be looking at observations of supernova in the past. That would be when this field is up here. And so what we do is we model this, we just basically approximate this potential by a straight line. Okay, assume that that's a good approximation during the recent past. And then these parameters here would be just the value of the straight, the value of the potential at the present, and then the slope of the line. Okay, and then um, we we can then predict what the past of our universe would be like, depending on those parameters, and ask how well does that past coming from the model fit the data? And then that's what this pink region is indicating, the values of the parameters that give a good fit. So the best fit happens when you have some slope of the potential this is the lambda CDM model where V1 is zero. So that's no change in the potential energy and the current value. This is the like 65 to 70% dark energy that we talk about um, as being the current observed value. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so. Does this mean like, yeah, so it does not mean that, which this is a, I mean, a very famous experiment um, proposed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in, the, in 1935. Einstein kind of wanted to like trash quantum mechanics. He didn't, Einstein didn't really like quantum mechanics, even though he was responsible for, like partly responsible for it, its origin. Um, so they, they thought about a situation where you have, say, two particles that are entangled with each other, but they're also traveling. So maybe their spins are entangled, and they're also traveling very far apart. And so because they're entangled, if someone here measures the state, let's say it's just a pair of bits. So this, this person here measures the state of one of the particles and say he finds it to be on or up or whatever. Um, so then according to the entangled state, the other person very far away would definitely end up measuring on as well if, if it's like on, on, superposed with off, off. And so it would seem like there's some weird superluminal communication because like as soon as this person measures on then if this person immediately measures right after that without enough time for light to propagate they'll also find on but there's not actually a way to use that to make any communication because when this person makes the measurement it's kind of random whether they'll find on or whether they'll find off um and so they can't like guarantee they're going to find on they can't do anything that would allow them to send a message faster than the speed of light to the other person. So it's more just that the state of the particles, like it, it existed in the superposition, and then that has the consequence that they're both going to end up either measuring on or either measuring on. But you're never you're never able to actually communicate superluminally using this. Uh, yes, please.
Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so right. So that that would basically mean we need to work harder with the theoretical side of things. So, so far in the context of holography, this is the kind of universe that we've been able to to like construct. I mean, if you asked me six years ago, then there wouldn't have been any universes that we've been able to construct. Um, so we already knew that we had to work harder, and so now if like it's possible that we just you know, don't know all the possibilities yet from the theory side. Um, but these holographic models, they seem to have a strong preference for situations where the dark energy can become negative. Um, that's just like a, a very basic feature of holographic models of quantum gravity. And so it's 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 really funny, like in historically, 1997 was when people came up with holographic models of quantum gravity, and they were all like, negative cosmological constant models. And then 1999, like two years later, with the observation of the acceleration of the universe, and then it was seeming to tell us that we have a positive dark energy. And so there was this conflict between what we can describe theoretically and then what we can what we seem to actually observe. Um, and I think people didn't really realize, like people definitely talked a lot about time dependent dark energy but they didn't really try to come up with realistic models of cosmology um, with, with the time dependent dark energy and the negative cosmological constant, I think until more, more recently. So I think, I think it's pretty interesting that um, like you what the, the main thing this shows you is that you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that you have a constant positive dark energy just because we see the acceleration. There's lots of the parameter space where you have the acceleration, but you have a decreasing dark energy that will become negative eventually. Say? Yeah, I'm just sort of curious if, uh, you know, if it keeps decreasing the dark energy, and maybe at one point it reaches like zero, but it doesn't decrease from zero, and other other, sort, other sorts of energy increase instead, so that you would have like, still uh, obey the conservation of energy, Yeah, and everything just stops there. You know, would that is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a kind of model people have considered in the past. Um, there's something called quintessence. And this typically has something like this scalar field and a time-dependent dark energy. And a lot of the quintessence models, they have that dark energy that's go to zero in the far future. Um, and there, the universe kind of keeps expanding, um, but it doesn't, it stops accelerating. So it just, it will just eventually asymptote and, and the scale factor is like a straight line or something. So it, it will keep expanding forever and there won't be a big crunch. Yeah. Yes. Um, are there theories as to what kind of mathematics is needed for this kind of research? Is there other physics research, like you know, for example, in your research? Yeah. And if like very, very few of the mathematics that somehow make their way to this kind of research over yeah. the years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's an amazing amount of mathematics that 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 has become an important part of this theoretical physics research. Um, something amazing to me is that mostly in the history of physics, when physicists have wanted to understand something new and then they, they actually need some new mathematics that hasn't been used in physics before, usually the mathematicians have already come up with that mathematics. Um, there are counter examples, but, um, but yeah, a lot of the times, people come up with interesting fields of mathematics and, and then like later they find some application in physics. Um, so examples with general relativity, obviously there's lots of geometry. So the, the field of differential geometries is, is important. Um, um, with quantum mechanics, basically the foundation of um, quantum mechanics is linear algebra. Um, and so, the fact that you could take any two configurations and then find a third configuration, which is an arbitrary superposition of those. Okay, the nice way to say that is that the space of physical configurations of a system is a vector space. Okay. So that's that's really um, is really what it's saying. So it says even if you hated linear algebra, um, 
you shouldn't have really hated it because that's really like the most important mathematical theory behind uh, behind quantum mechanics, which is like our most fundamental one of our most fundamental theories of nature. Okay, so that's linear algebra is a big deal um, in physics, and then obviously all the calculus uh, type things. Um, group theory comes in. So so other algebra things like group theory, which is math three twenty two, um, comes into physics a lot when you're thinking about symmetries of various systems. Um, in string theory, even some fairly advanced, um, so you might know that people in string theory um, consider a lot uh, models with extra dimensions where, where fundamentally the, the universe would be maybe 10 dimensional, but then some of the dimensions are very, uh, very small or, or compact, um, like with a, with a hose, with a garden hose, that's the surface of that is two dimensional. But if you, if you just think about looking at it from a, a large distance, it would kind of look one dimensional. So it might be the same with our universe. Maybe there are some small dimensions. And so there's a bunch more advanced geometry that comes into that algebraic geometry um, is a big deal when, when people are thinking about string theory. Um, even, I, yeah, I took math 320 and math, I took all this real analysis when I, when I was a student here um, and I thought, Okay, I'm gonna need this for like understanding quantum mechanics and physics because they were like talking about Hilbert spaces in the course descriptions in the calendar. Um, anyways, for many years, I I thought like, okay, that was like the biggest waste of time in my life to take all those real analysis courses because like I never had to 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 use any of it and, and use epsilons and deltas and and theorems and all that. Um, and then like this last year, I had a project with an undergraduate seraphim about quantum mechanics. Um, and we ended up like wanting to prove some like just basic things in quantum theory. Um, and then I needed like pretty much the entire course, like like all these things about compact spaces and closed sets and convexity and epsilons and deltas. So uh, yeah, even, even some of that more formal mathematics comes in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, let me go back to okay. So basically, we can. We can understand this connection um, just for like general knowledge. In the 1970s, people like um, Jacob Beckenstein and Stephen Hawking and others, they started to realize that certain properties of black holes were very similar to certain properties of thermodynamic systems. Um, so they saw these parallels where like the area of a horizon of a black hole. I didn't even tell you what that is. The, the horizon, I think you know, is like the place where if you go past that, you can never get out. And so it has some area. And the rules for that area, what can happen to it if you use Einstein's equations and throw stuff into the black hole and so forth. The rules are just like the rules for entropy and thermodynamics. So there's sort of a first law of black hole dynamics that says if you throw something in, then the entropy will increase, but the mass of the black hole also increases. And there's something that looks like the first law of thermodynamics where energy becomes mass and entropy becomes area. And, and then there's, the, there's a temperature. Um, and there's a second law where the classical evolution, if you're throwing things into black holes or they merge, then the area of the horizon always seems to increase. Um, and, and so this was like puzzling because people didn't have any idea what black holes would have to do with thermodynamic systems. With holography, it's just literally that the black hole in gravity in the more fundamental underlying description, it is exactly like the thermal state of, of this two-dimensional system. And so the the different possible states so you can understand the entropy using statistical mechanics and saying okay well there's like a lot of different possible microscopic states that would have the same 
overall macroscopic description, the same energy density. Um, and you can just like count those states and figure out an entropy, regular thermodynamic entropy, and then that matches with the area of the horizon of the black hole. So all of those connections that people like noticed in the 1970s without understanding at all, they, they sort of follow immediately from this correspondence because the black hole is a thermodynamic system. And so all your laws of thermodynamics, then you could translate them into laws that apply to the black hole and, and then you get all these things. So that, that's one of the really incredible things that, uh, that happened with this holography. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, where would you find this uh, 2D holographical system? Like, is it, does it exist physically or is it different? Okay, okay. so yeah, you, you have to imagine that you're a Minecraft character having a conversation with another Minecraft character and asking them where you would find the computer chip that we're talking about. <laughs> so that's the answer. It's not like part of the universe that we experience. So it's if there is a, a 2D system that's behind everything, it's like, it's it's separate from, from what we observe. So we couldn't really find it uh, in, in any sense. But we could, we could sort of show, like if you were, I don't know, clever enough, you might be able to understand the mathematics of it and, and how it could be related. You might be able to realize that what you're experiencing um, could also be explained in this other way and you could like, deduce the, the code for Minecraft and say, okay, here's here's really the way it works. There's this, there's all these bits somewhere, and then there's this assembly language code that tells what happens to the bits, and then there's this like dictionary that says what comes out on the screen and see if you obey these laws, then uh, you know if I do this with my axe, then this will happen. Uh, yeah, I'm out. So no, actually it's weird. You can have a finite dimension, a finite size of the 2D sphere. Um, but the in, the infinity kind of comes from being able to look at infinitely short distances. Um, and so if you want an infinite universe here, um, you need a very you need a very special kind of um, to these uh, systems. So it's not quite like a, a ball of copper where if you look close enough, then it's it's kind of like just like atoms. Um, there's there's a, a kind of a system that we call a conformal field theory. And that's basically a physical system. It's, it's kind of like Maxwell's equations. Like when you study electromagnetism, you're allowed to have electromagnetic waves with arbitrarily short wavelengths. Okay, so there's no limit in classical electromagnetism um, to how how small features in the electromagnetic field can be. And so it's basically that. Um, so with this theory, you can have features in the field uh, in, in the in the system here at arbitrarily small distance scales. You could have something interesting happening, and that would translate to the fact that you could have stuff um, farther and farther out in the, in the universe. Um, I think Miles and I'll give you that. Uh, is there any implication in the theory that after a big place in the graph, there would be some other big thing? So, yeah, I don't think so. Um, people talk about models like that a lot. Um, and actually, there are, very, okay, there are variants of this thing that I'm talking about where I think that might happen. In the simplest examples that, that we've been studying, there's nothing like that that you would have. It's just actually something like a, a, a final state. Like you have the beginning, you have the end, and it's actually just a finite amount of time. And there's not really any sense in which there's something beyond that. Um, but I guess it's possible there could be some, some variation of the model where something else could happen. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, what about to what you're talking about? Uh, what, what yeah. Was this when the things you did to say that the last part of it started out with the one zero one zero about? Yeah. 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 So, um, 
there could definitely have been a, a lot of dark energy then. Like, so um, if you go back to, okay. So if we go back to this basic evolution equation for the universe, um, the dark energy becomes more and more important, relatively speaking, the larger the scale factor gets. So if we go backwards, um, A decreases. And then there was a time like, I don't know, some, some billions of years after the beginning where the dark energy would have had the same magnitude as the energy from matter and radiation. And then before that, actually, the dark energy doesn't really, um, like, if it were its present value, it would have been totally negligible. So then even if it were decreasing, depending on the way that it's decreasing, it's possible that, you know, it, it could it could have been decreasing um, like slower than the matter and the radiation or more quickly. Um, so it's definitely possible to accommodate a very high dark energy in the past and still be consistent with everything. Um, I'll just mention that one of the standard parts of our understanding of cosmology is that like we think for various reasons that there was this period early in the universe where you have a super rapid expansion. Um, this is the inflationary phase of cosmology. Um, we're not absolutely like mo like 99% of cosmologists were, would tell you that that they're pretty sure that that happens. Um, some people are are definitely not sure. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm sure, but um, so the inflationary phase of cosmology basically um, was saying that there was this period really early on where there was actually a really high dark energy, like many many, many orders of magnitude higher than it is now, um, and that dark energy was responsible for the rapid um, acceleration during inflation. And the models that we have for inflation are actually just like this, where you have some, some extra field, a scalar field, and it had a value um, that's that's way, way higher than the values that I'm talking about. And then it had, you know, at some point it decreased and then became irrelevant. So it's actually already a part of our standard textbook understanding of cosmology that there would have been during some phase of the universe, this time dependent dark energy, and then that would have uh, gone away. So it's really not that radical to imagine that even our late time universe is also some time dependent dark energy that, that went away, that, that, that's going to go away eventually. Um, yes? Is dark matter clear? Well, yeah, so, so dark matter is another puzzle. Um, we don't know what it is. Um, it's part of this term here. Um, and what we know from observations is that there's, if, if you look at the energy density um, of matter in the universe, then there seems to be a lot more stuff there than we can see. Um, and so people are trying to figure out what could that be? Could it be some exotic particle or, um, or uh, you know, there's also, like I said, some little black holes. So there's all sorts of different theories for, for what it, dark matter could be. Um, and I think these holographic models might suggest specific um, kinds of possibilities for what it might be. Um, so one possibility, if you do have this time-dependent dark energy, um, so then, then there's this extra field that I was talking about. And when you have an extra field, um, that means that there should be particles associated with that field as well. So like the the electromagnetic field uh, associated with photons and and the there's this Higgs particle associated with the Higgs field. Um, this field would have a particle associated with it, and that should be a super light particle. Um, and so one of the candidates that people sometimes talk about for dark matter um, is something called an axion. And so axion dark matter would involve like a lot of these really super light particles that are very difficult to observe. Um, and so maybe I, like basically we haven't explored in the model um, how many of these very light particles there would be and if, if they could be a significant tr contributor to dark matter. Um, but that would be one, one direction um, where this, this kind of model could possibly give you an idea or it's some, something to look into. So yeah, we're, we're um, wanting to explore that as a possible candidate for dark matter, um, but, but maybe there are other things.
Um, then, um, did like this dummy, um, hold on, did, like, is that true? Is that like, yeah, because like, have you ever thought of like, if it means that there's something like bigger outside our universe that governs our universe, and maybe it's like, in the way you use it, it's like everything. Well, yeah, I mean, it does. Like, it's really saying that there's some, it's like not physical, it's not even the same geometrical space. So it wouldn't be outside our universe, but it's it's like under, it seems like it would be underlying our universe and what we experience. There's this other reality, which you know, like maybe is even more real or, or like the, it's maybe more fundamental because I gave you examples where you could take that quantum system and then if you didn't have any entanglement there, you wouldn't have any space. And so it's from that point of view, it's a bit like, you know, imagine you're, um, I don't know, a shark, okay? So, so imagine you're a shark um, and, and then if you think about like the water is like the fundamental thing of the universe and, and like uh, there are equations, the, the Navier-Stokes equations, um, your shark theoretical physics community has come up with the Navier Stokes equations and they that you know they think they explain everything. Um, but then actually what what the real story is is that the the water is only something it's like a special thing that happens when you take a lot of water molecules and you put them into a special kind of a state where they're close together. And then there's some some more fundamental reality where where you know you could have nature you could have like water molecules all over the place but there wouldn't be water and and then your laws your navier stokes equations for fluid dynamics would not even be relevant in that situation so um that's why i kind of think of it maybe that way where the space time people will use the word emergent where the space time emerges when certain things happen in the underlying theory when you have a, a certain pa pattern of entanglement in this underlying theory then you get space time but you could imagine some other pattern of entanglement where the different parts are not entangled, and that would be more like the water molecules being all separated from each other. So that like multiverse implication, but multi okay, multiverse is something a bit different, um, which is more okay. In the string theory community. Um, so after 1999, when, when they had the observations of the accelerating universe, and, and so then people were thinking, oh, it seems like we have a positive cosmological constant. Um, so then people in the string theory universe uh, came up with this idea for how to explain like the Big Bang and things. So they, they had the following thought that in, in a situation where you have a lot of possibilities, so, so okay, string theory um, maybe has a lot of solutions. And so maybe it could describe multiple possible realities with like, different kinds of particles. In each. So we have the standard model, a certain set of particles and forces. Um, and you can kind of think of that, that's maybe some solution of string theory, uh, which is a more basic theory and has maybe 10 dimensions. And then depending on the shape of the six dimensions that we don't see, you get a certain set of particles in nature. Okay, but then maybe, and, and so maybe our universe corresponds to some shape for extra dimensions of the underlying theory. But then maybe there's some other solution where there's a different shape of the extra dimensions and another one and so people came up with this idea of the landscape of string theory, which would be just like all the possibilities that you could get starting from the full string theory and then finding all the solutions for what shapes the extra dimensions could take and then looking at um, the physics. And so people thought, okay, yeah, maybe there's all these solutions. And each one of those is gonna have a certain kind of value for the cosmological constant, um, like the dark energy value. And then what would be what would be the consequence of that? Um, and so what they realize is if, if you're in a, an accelerating universe um, with a certain value of the cosmological constant, okay, and if your theory has these other possibilities, 
Okay, then it sort of behaves like a, like when you have different states of matter, um, when you might have liquid, and then but there's also this other phase possible. And then in some cases, you can you know have a bubble of this other phase, like a bubble of gas forming a liquid, and that that could sort of expand. Like when you have water boiling, you could you could start in one phase, and then you could get some of the other phase happening. Um, and so people realize that if you had string theory and then there were a lot of different solutions with different values of the cosmological constant, um, when you have a positive cosmological constant and the universe is expanding and accelerating, um, that's actually a situation where you could get a bubble of another phase happening. And so there's some probability for that to happen. Um, and so you would, you would then not just have the universe accelerating forever, you would eventually produce like a bubble of a new universe. And that would tend to have a smaller value of the dark energy. Okay, and then that would that universe would expand. And then there'd be, I don't know, another bubble could form here. And then it expands some and you got those bubbles get bigger. And then there could be a bubble in that one and a bubble in this one. Okay. And then it kind of goes on forever. And so this is sometimes called the bubbling multiverse. And so that would be saying, according to this picture of reality, we would be in one of these bubbles with a small cosmological, uh, with a small dark energy. Um, and then in the, in the far future, maybe there'd be another bubble with forms and bubbles forming in that. So you would keep making new universes um, and and so, yeah, that, that actually might be the most conventional picture of how string theory might describe our universe. Um, but I find that to be a little bit disgusting, um, kind of mathematically speaking. I have no idea how you would represent that in some like mathematical theory that you could actually write down. So I'm a little bit worried that that whole picture doesn't, like that there's no way to actually make sense of it. Um, but it's still like the most conventional picture because I think still a lot of people are, are stuck on the idea that probably the dark energy is constant in time. And, and so if, if you have that in string theory, then you would probably have something like this. Can I see um, like following the logic of you and Encode that too. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it can, but I I have no idea how. Like people have thought about people have. It's been twenty five years almost since we knew there was positive like acceleration, and people have thought about how to embed that into string theory with a uh, a constant positive dark energy, and nobody knows how to. Nobody has like a single consistent model for how to do that. So. Um, so that could just be, could just be, it's really hard and we don't have the, we haven't maybe developed the right mathematics yet, but it could be that that's just not the right way. Um, so I don't know. I think, it, I think maybe I'm in a minority of people that think, okay, maybe we should just be doing something simpler than the infinite bubbling multiverse and just yeah, this this negative this time dependent dark energy and the holographic model I, to me seems like a simpler approach. Yes. Um, you said uh, the big crunch is there. Yes. Is there a reason why you need that? Like, is there something in the encoding? Well, just just because in in the models that we're able to write down that we have mathematical control over, um, the only way that I know to explain an acceleration in the universe is to have this time dependent dark energy that ultimately becomes negative. Um, so it's really just a statement about what I know how to do right now. Um, but I mean, people have been working on this for, for a couple of decades. And so um, so nobody, nobody really knows how to write down a model of cosmology that's fully mathematically consistent that doesn't have that crunch. Um, and so that might just be because we haven't been smart enough to figure out how to do it. But currently, um, that's just like the kinds of gravity theories that we really know how to describe in quantum gravity have this negative 
value of the dark energy. Um, and so if you have a positive dark energy, it's only temporary uh, and you would switch the sign and that causes the universe to re-collapse uh, again. So, sorry. So you mentioned um, how there could be a complex plane of time. Yeah. And from what I understand of time is at any coordinate, it represents a given state of our universe. Yes. 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 Yeah. What would the imaginary plane then represent? Yeah, so it's not really, it's not really um, a physical thing. It's it's more like part of the mathematics. So let me let me give you an example. Um, so pick your favorite function. I don't know what's your favorite function. And that's supposed to be okay. That case is all right. Uh, so yeah, m mx plus b. Okay. Um, right. So that function we can we can draw it. Um, and it's a straight line. Okay. So that function, um, it totally makes sense mathematically to say, what if x is a complex number? Okay. It completely mathematically makes sense to say, what is that function? if x is four plus three i, okay? And then, and then just that you have to say that the value of the function is also a complex number, okay? Um, same thing with like cosine, um, cosine x. Uh, totally makes sense to say, what if x is i? What if x is three plus four i? Um, and so it totally makes sense. Um, it's actually just like cos of i times, uh, uh, X is equal to cosh of X. So the so there's like this nice unification between cosine and hyperbolic cosine that we can consider um, functions along the imaginary axis. Okay. So you have to, in this case, actually, it's it's nice because you you still get real values. If if you just set the real part to zero and you go along the imaginary part, you still get real values. Okay. Um, and so in in physics, like we're you know we have a lot of physical quantities that we keep track of, if we're thinking about the evolution in physics, um, then you have, you know, the position of all kinds of particles, and, and those are functions of time, and the energy density in different parts of space, that'd be some function of time. These equations of physics tell you how these things evolve in real, in real time. Um, and so in some cases, um, it just, like for certain physical theories, and, and this is one example, um, it also just totally makes sense to think of all those physical quantities also as being functions that can be extended to imaginary time. Um, and so with this with this cosmology picture, um, what happens is that like when I go to imaginary time, I still get real things. It's kind of like this cos and cosh thing. Um, so if I talked about the geometry of space, um, okay, that's just like, we encode that in a set of functions. Um, it's, it's, you'll eventually learn how to describe the geometry of the space, but it's basically just a certain set of functions of, this, of the space and the time. And then we can ask, okay, what happens if I make the time an imaginary thing? Well, in this case, you still get a, a nice real geometry and you can draw like a picture of the geometry and and then it's this wormhole. Uh, there's a like there's a little bit more to say. Um, it's actually very common in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory um, to make use of, of this imaginary time. Um, and so certain special states of quantum systems have a really nice interpretation for what happens in imaginary time um, and other ones don't. And so we're what we're kind of saying here is that um, the state of cosmology in these models, um, it has this nice property that everything sort of makes sense if you ask what happens in imaginary time. And, and so that picture is actually even, the reason why it's useful for us is that in imaginary time, you don't have a big bang and a big crunch. Um, those are places where things get really complicated to do the physics. Um, so if you, if you kind of work in imaginary time, it's much easier to do the calculations, make the predictions, and then 
do the opposite direction where you say, okay, what if my imaginary time thing is, will make that imaginary to go back to real time and look at it? Okay. Um, I, okay. Yeah, I'll do you and then you. Yeah. All right, so because this whole idea of holography is out of our field of view, if you will, yeah. Um, is there any way to really experimentally prove it exists? Yeah, so I mean, the way I think about it is like, so what I've talked about is a bit of an example. So let's say we we believe it's true. Okay. Um. So so then there should be a certain like let's say we could completely understand the full set of things that you can get in a gravitational universe based on a holographic model. Um, um, and so, so that might be a more limited set of things than with just all the possible theories I can consider. So as an example, what I'm telling you is that it seems like the only way to get acceleration in the universe out of a holographic model is to have a time dependent um, uh, time dependent garden. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's not true because we just haven't totally understood the full space of things. But supposing that you had enough control over holographic models to know what are all the possibilities. Um, um, so so then that's kind of like making predictions for what our universe would be like. So I'm saying, you know, let, let's say I was making my statement based on a complete knowledge of everything that you could possibly get in string theory, then I would say, okay, well, I know everything that holography can do. And one of the things that I, I can say in general is that this dark energy that we seem to observe has to be decreasing. So now go out and like, build your telescope and, and check. And if it's not decreasing, then I'm wrong, and you know, maybe there's this is not a holographic holographic picture. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I would hope that you could, you could predict um, things to look for, like the decreasing dark energy, or maybe the models will, maybe the models if we study them further will suggest that um, that a certain kind of thing tends to be there as dark matter, and so that could guide our observations where we're trying to look for possible dark matter. Like right now people are just kind of looking for anything. They just they have no idea. People consider just 30 orders of magnitude of possibilities for what the mass of a dark matter particle could be. And then some people are thinking it just it could be black holes. And we just like really are, are trying to explore all the possibilities. But if you had like with the, the holographic setting if, if that said, oh yeah, like most of the time there are these uh, light scalar particles that would be there in a large abundance um, and, and would be perceived to be dark matter. And that would suggest that you should maybe focus your efforts a little bit more on, on looking for that to be a dark matter. Um, and then, yes. Um, so it's a good thing because we're currently in the cosmic acceleration. Yeah. Do any of the models know that? Right, so you can look at basically, um, okay. So the thing you can do is look at this parameter space. Um, so this, okay, this is a little bit, remember to get this, I was assuming that we're, that it's, a, it's valid to approximate the potential as a straight line in, in the recent past. Um, so if we also kind of extended that approximation um, to the future, so if, if it's also well modeled by a straight line down to where it's going to be zero and where it starts to be collapsing, then you could ask about, so typically in these examples of parameters where um, we fit the current data, how long would it be before the university collapses? And so the Typical answer is about 10 billion years. I think we, if I'm remembering correctly from our paper, um, but yeah, you can check it here. So, like roughly the current age of the universe again, and then it Yeah. Um, so, yep, what's that? Oh, uh, yeah, I can.
Okay. I wanted to be, yeah, we wanted to be like really modest about the title. So I, I thought it'd be like get rejected if we were too uh, strong. So possible hints of decreasing dark energy from supernova data. Um, and uh, who was, you had a question, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so no, this is uh, here. Um, um, Okay, yeah, this is another paper. Um, so I'll talk, yeah, the current state of this is that we were able to derive um, the Einstein equations kind of in, like so far in uh, a situation where the gravity is relatively weak. So if you think about um, the Einstein equations that would be relevant for our solar system, um, so we don't have any black holes, then you can you can kind of approximate those by some simpler equations, kind of like we call it linearized Einstein equations. Um, and and so uh, and and then we so that this was the first paper uh, where we did that. And then there were various follow ups. And so we were also able to see non like the the leading nonlinear effects of gravity also coming from some entanglement physics. Uh, um, and so um, like presumably it's possible to to go forward from that um, and and get like the, the full nonlinear equations. But so far we that hasn't happened um, in a totally convincing way. But yeah, I mean I think basically to me it's it's already convincing enough that like the, the gravity, the at least the equations for for most ordinary gravitational physics um are are already captured by this entanglement dynamics and it's probably just a mathematical step um if you wanted to extend that to the equations like the full equations that you would need if you wanted to study black holes and, and so forth well i mean i think yeah i think it's already like just just being able to start from some mathematics of quantum entanglement and to get like most of the, the like most of the Einstein equations that people have ever used um, for most physics uh, is, is already pretty cool um, but yeah I, I mean I think obviously it'd be great to to get the full thing and um, um, I mean it's a very active area of research now this this whole um, entanglement gravity connection over the last 10 15 years tons of people are just like the the, one of the hottest topics in, in physics and in like theoretical physics. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is there like, why does a superposition collapse? Mm -hmm. Um. So. Yeah, there's sort of a mathematical answer to that. Um, there's another. No better. Uh, maybe I'll say it in words. OK, so. Um, so when you describe the state of an object um, just all by itself, and that's the only part of your quantum system, um, then yeah, it's generally going to be in some super one of these superpositions, and it like it can't really get out, it can't really get out of that. Like you, it's always in a in a it could be in a in one definite configuration, or it can be in a superposition of those. 
Um, but there's actually a new possibility once you have another part from your system. Um, then we talked a little bit about how you can have these entangled states where it's like on and then the other part is on and it's off and the other part is off. Okay. And so in that state, there's a 50 50 uh, probability that you would find it on or off. But it's actually mathematically different than the superposition if you just had one particle um, being on or off. Um, and so, oh, there's more times. I, I should really. Okay. Okay, so yeah, say we have this guy, um, and then it could be in a superposition. Okay, so so you have this superposition, um, and now when you measure something, there's some other part of your physical system that comes in and interacts with this. And so here's your like measuring device, which has an on side and an off side. Um, and so when these two things interact, what happens is that like they become entangled somehow. Um, and then it's more like you get, so if, if you describe that whole thing quantum mechanically, after this interaction, You have a different kind of superposition of of a state where the particle is like this thing is on and the measuring device reads on and this thing is off and the measuring device reads off okay. um and and so mathematically if i just then go back and say well what's the state of this particle um there's it's like a, a different description than this so here it's a quantum superposition. And then if if I do the mathematics of quantum mechanics and I say, what's the state of, of this system here after the measurement happens? Um, it's it's yeah, it's something different. That's what that's all I could say. That where where like this state is just actually a 50-50 classical probability of two possibility, two, two possible outcomes. Um, so this thing about collapse is related to a physical process when a thing in a superposition interacts with some environment or a measuring device and then it becomes a different sort of like it's not a quantum superposition anymore it's it's what we call a classical superposition so there, there is something that happens when that interaction happens where where this quantum superposition of possibilities becomes like a list of actual possibilities. I guess that's that's the best I could say at this point. Um, Ariella? Um, well, for the second string, like- This is like, what, this is like one of those Mr. Beast kind of episodes where whoever stays here until tomorrow gets there. Uh, yeah. So there's like a definitive time between like, there's the big crunch or whatever. Yeah. But you said in imaginary time, that doesn't happen. Yeah. So could you just like hide out in imaginary time, wait for the big crunch to happen? Yeah, sadly, no. Yeah, sadly, like we can't actually travel to this imaginary time. Um, where we kind of just forced to evolve. But I mean, the good thing is that, you know, it's you're going to be dead way, way, way before that. <laughs> Yeah. How can you tell that two particles or two things are entangled? And uh, how, how do you differentiate that between like five particles that position? Um, yeah, so it's it's hard. Like basically what you can do is um, you kind of need multiple copies of the same quantum system. So like, let's say I talk about the hydrogen atom with the spin of the electron and the spin of the proton. Okay. And then I can I can basically take that same hydrogen atom in its lowest energy state. And then I could just measure many, many times the state of the 
of the electron and the state of the proton. And I'll, I'll just keep doing that. And every single time I'll find the electron spin is in the opposite direction to the proton spin, but I'll get different possibilities each time. Um, and so then I would realize that, okay, those two things are entangled because um, you know, there, it seems to be random what the outcome of my measurement is, but the spin of the electron is always correlated with the spin of the proton. And so that would be one way that you, you know, deduce that a system is entangled. If, if you were able to have multiple copies of the system, um, if you just have one copy of the system, then it's it's usually not possible to to understand that. Um, unless, yeah, I mean, like maybe cert certain kinds of measurements, um, there's certain kinds of measurements that could actually tell you, um, at least after the measurement, that you were in an entangled state. But, but yeah, usually you just have a little bit of fun. That's called quantum tomography, if you want to figure out the quantum state of the system by doing lots of measurements, then, then you're doing quantum tomography. Uh, so I guess, so you were talking about how the entangled structure like is conceived in our universe. Yeah. But um does it also describe quantum entanglement in our universe or is that like have you Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Great question. So um so I said like the classical geometry of space is coming from uh, quantum entanglement of this underlying system. Mm -hmm. But then we also expect there to be quantum physics in our space, like mm -hmm. the entanglement between the proton and the electron in our hydrogen atom. Um, and so, yeah, actually that's coming from also entanglement in, in the underlying system. Uh, and it's kind of like a, you can distinguish them by just the, um, the, the amount of, Entanglement, and so there's there's some parameter uh, in in this underlying system. There's some parameter in the physical model. I'll just call it n. It's like some big number, and so if you ask about the entanglement between um, two parts, so if you try to quantify the entanglement between two parts of the sphere, um, so I pick some regions uh, and I ask. How much of these entangle? And then the answer is going to be something like um, entanglement equals I don't know, seven times n plus four plus. So there's a way to like represent this as a, a series um, where there's some most important part of the answer, which maybe depends. Is the size of the n, and then there's some other corrections to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so mathematically, the way it works is that like the the biggest part of the entanglement in the underlying system is telling you about the this geometry, and then on top of that, you can have the same geometry, but then actual entanglement in the geometry, and that's controlled by these smaller bits that. Are added on to the entanglement. So there's certain questions you could ask, certain specific questions you could ask here that would be more sensitive to just this part of it, and those would be the ways that you would probe the entanglement of stuff in the space. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me on uh, the 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 one whole energy uh, that you showed in your last slide and how that corresponds to the uh, uh, CMBR and like yeah, we use CMBR as well as what does CMBR represent? It's not a big combination. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so yeah, this is basically something that we we are trying to work towards. Um, and so yeah, so our standard picture of cosmology is. Is you have um, this, you, you have this, these microwaves that we look out in the sky, we see these microwaves, and it, it looks like the thermal radiation from a, a very cool object, but the temperature varies a little bit depending on what direction in the sky you look at. Um, and 
And then those variations are basically related to small variations in the temp in in um, like a long time ago when when the universe was kind of like the inside of the sun, just the just inside the sun, there was some some kind of plasma, and then a little bit later, this is around three hundred thousand years ago, um, the universe went through this transition where um, now it's more like just outside the sun. Um, so the the plot the charged particles form atoms and molecules, and then the universe kind of becomes transparent. So instead of the light strongly interacting with all the charged particles, it can just kind of go and and at that time in the universe, there were like a little slight inhomogeneities. It was a little bit different some places. And um, the theory of inflation tries to make predictions for for how big these inhomogeneities are and their properties. And so we normally think about um, inflation creating inhomogeneities, and then that propagates forward to something that we observe now. Um, and and so in these holographic models, it's kind of interesting in that, okay, so we that would propagate forward. Um, and then there would also be some CMB at this time in the future when things recollapse. Okay. And the CMB <clears throat> correlations would be examples of physical quantities that I could also then ask about what happens to them in imaginary time. Okay, so there'd be like some CMB correlators here, and then those would ultimately be related to some correlators on this boundary, um, like uh, on the, uh, the ends of the wormhole. <clears throat> um, and, and actually that's the place in, in these models, this is like the place where they would be easiest to compute. Um, and, and so that's what we're trying to do is like, can we compute them here and then extrapolate them all the way here and then back in time. Like mathematically, it's just some function of time and they evolve forward, but you can also evolve the equation backward. I mean, it's like, if I told you the exact state of the universe at this future time, we could say, okay, well then, then there's this backwards evolution and that could produce the, the CMB that we see now. Um, so, Yes, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's weird that um, something you think is being caused by something here could also be explained in a different way. Like the causation would would seem to be different, but but like mathematically, uh, well, this is just a function that exists for all time. And so you know, you, if you had some other way of calculating it here, I mean, you should get the same answer that you'd get by just evolving all the time. CMB forward and then an imaginary time. Um, so, I mean, it could be that we do all these calculations and then we end up getting predictions for the CMB that are not at all realistic. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll be realistic. One really in, there's a there's a super interesting fact um, about these models. So, one of the big puzzles with the CMB is that like we look out in some directions and, and there's light coming from one direction, and you look in like the opposite direction, and we can measure certain correlations between the light coming from over here and the light coming from over here. Like these, these things are like correlated in some way as if they had been interacting sometime in the past. Um, but if we evolve the equations backward to the Big Bang, then the place where this light is coming from never had anything to do with the place where this light is coming from. Okay, so it's like, you know, there's something magical, magically set up there in the CMB that we we can't really explain using ordinary evolution. I mean, it's, it's like you're seeing the same image over here and over here almost, um, but but those two places in the universe could never um, have communicated. And so this theory of inflation. Um, helps explain that by saying, oh, actually there like right after the Big Bang, there was this other phase of the universe where it started like really um, a lot smaller and then it exponentially expanded. And so these two places that you're seeing um, that look to be correlated in the CMB, actually they were at some point during this inflationary phase um, communicating with each other. And so you could explain that correlation using inflation. Um, so, 
with, with this sort of model, um, it turns out that you're just always going to get those this, this quantum states that have a nice imaginary time picture like this. Um, they always have these correlations that someone in this universe would find weird. So you like don't necessarily have to have the inflationary part of cosmology in order to explain these, these observations. Um, of course, inflation does what a lot more than that. It quantitatively predicts what the CMB looks like. So, um, so maybe like more likely it's just that we have inflation here, but then there's like another way that you could also describe the same physics um, over here. Yes. So for for the imaginary time kind of plane theory, is that yeah. functionally is it used mostly as just like a check around saying like I have this prediction that seems to calculate because it's imaginary, like kind of like go back back right here and see if it correlates with what we observe. Um, and there's not so much. It's just like the mathematical. This is what it should be. That's what it is now. Is that sort of what it is useful? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you could take that point of view that that like the real physics is in in real time, and then we don't we don't really ever need to talk about that. We would have like some wave function for the stuff in the universe, and that would evolve by a, a Schrodinger equation. Um, and yeah, it, it is puzzle like. From that perspective, it's a bit public puzzling, like what actually happens at at the Big Bang and, and the Big Crunch, um, and so that definitely helps explain certain things physically. That um, if you didn't have this imaginary time picture, they might just be puzzling features. So, so I don't know. I, it's probably just do, do you want to call it real or not real? I, I guess you could choose you could choose to think of it as just like a part of the mathematical theory that is there and is useful to calculate real things or you could decide to to call that part of the physical reality that we just don't directly observe i don't know if it i don't know if there's an actual difference between those two things right. uh, yes um, so yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, people have debated this, and we wrote about it a little bit. Um, and so, so there's like the question. This is like related to the thing that people call the arrow of time, and so. Um, <clears throat> What I think is probably true is that the second law of thermodynamics should continue to hold. Um, and so, so this is entropy increases. So you have, you have a situation with lower entropy in the past and then entropy increases. Um, and then what I think will happen is that it should keep increasing until this big crunch. Okay. Um, but then that makes it sound like there's some like fundamental asymmetry here that the that I mean my pictures are pretty symmetrical. This one. Um, but okay, so par so part of the story here I think is that wh when we look at our cosmology, um, even in standard cosmology, we think that what we see is kind of just like one, um, one possibility that is part of some, like a wave function of the universe. So if, if you think about um, like our standard models of cosmology, you have this inflationary period, and then out of that, um, you get, the structure in the universe comes about um, from some kind of quantum effects that happens during inflation. Um, say quantum fluctuations and in inflation led to the slight variations in density that lead to galaxy formation and all that. Um, and so in inflation, what happens is that like the end of the inflation, 
you you get something like a superposition of possibilities for what those what those fluctuations are. So inflation doesn't just tell you, okay, there's a little bit more energy here and a little bit more energy here and a little bit more energy here. Inflation will tell you that the quantum state of the universe at, at really, really early times is a superposition of all sorts of possibilities. And then these possibilities, there's a wave function that describes those, they evolve forward. And then we kind of experience one of these things, but in maybe the full description of the universe, there are other possibilities that are present. So this is like the, um, right, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is actually favored by most physicists at this point, that, that there could be a wave function for the universe describing many different possibilities and, and then we could only be experience, experiencing one of them. Um, and so in our context, I guess it's possible, like the, first, the second law of thermodynamics is something macroscopic that we see in one instance of the universe. Um, so it's possible that it holds for our universe and that our, what we observe is asymmetric. It was less entropy before and then more entropy later. Um, but it, mathematically, it's still possible that the whole thing could have this time symmetry that you might have in this collection of possibilities, some possibilities where entropy is increasing this way and then other possibilities where entropy is increasing this way. Um, but anyways, I'm really confused about that point. So I, I don't have anything, uh, I don't have anything great to say, but I think, uh, I would love to understand the arrow of time and the second law and how that could emerge from a time or if that could emerge from a time symmetric situation. Irene. Um, so yeah. So. I mean, they're like, I would call, I would say that's sort of fundamental in the sense that I could write down some precise mathematical equations that, that tell you exactly what is that model. Um, and so, um, so like we, yeah, we can't quite, can't really do that on the gravity side, but, but I could do it for some examples of holographic models. And so then, if, like, if I can write down these precise equations that, like, allow me to study the system precisely mathematically, you know, or perhaps simulate it on a computer, like with with the simulations we did in our in our class, um, you you have some equations, and then we sort of said, okay, well, we could, if we wanted to, put those on the computer, and then all the physics we expect uh, comes out of that, um, and. So if we had a similar thing, if we had some very precise equations for this 2D system in the holography, um, that would be a complete description because we could probably ask any question we want and then simulate it if we wanted to and find out the answer. So, um, I mean, it might be that there are multiple different descriptions of the same thing. So some, some people think that maybe there's a different way of describing the physics where you're more working with the gravity language and um, and you have like a different mathematical description that is also precise and that is equivalent. Um, but I'm not sure if that's true. Like to me, it, it, as I was saying before, it feels like the gravity side is more emergent. It like could, you could have space time or you could not have space time. And it's clearer to see that from the other picture where you could have entanglement or not entanglement. Yes. In the bubble diagram we did a while ago with the yeah. little bubble universe. Bubble and multiverse, yeah. So do those small universes exist in some sort of bigger universe? Or how does that Yeah, work? so they would I mean in that in that picture, um oh, actually in shock. Okay. So in that picture, we <clears> would be <throat> here. In some universe, um, that would be like inside some expanding bubble, and then outside of that bubble, there would be another part of the universe. 
And this part of the universe would have different physical laws, like different kinds of particles. If we have electromagnetism and the strong force and the weak force, but over here, there could be like totally different particles and forces. Okay, and then that part of the universe, maybe there's another bubble that's like our universe in that part. Um, but then maybe there's another bubble, uh, which is which also has different physical laws, and you end up with these fourteen-legged creatures, telepathic uh, uh, creatures, and then you know our universe eventually could form a bubble with a, with a different universe in there, different physical laws, and so so that would be the the bubbling multiverse picture of our current reality that we would be here inside a bubble of the universe that would have a larger universe inside it and then that could all that part of the universe would all be in a bubble and then there'd be even another part and more bubbles and um, it's all a bit disgusting as I said. So is the big outside bubble is that also expanding? Yeah, everything is expanding. Yeah, everything is expanding. And generally, like these ones are expanding even faster. So these bubbles don't tend to collide with each other because the outside, the further outside you are, the faster it tends to be expanding, the larger the dark energy tends to be. And so you've got a like, really fast expansion and then slower expansion. And, and so every time a new bubble forms, uh, it's I guess it's likely that that one will, will not necessarily collide with any other one. Although you could, yeah, you could have bubble collisions. Uh, people wrote papers about what you would see, what we should look for out in the universe that would tell us that our bubble collided with another bubble. So people write papers about this stuff. Yeah, but you lost the way the bubbles there. Yeah, they would they would be different. I mean, they, they still like part. Th there would still be. Like energy, so so some basic parts of physics would still be there in all of the cases. Like you would still have quantum mechanics as a fundamental set of rules. You would still have energy conservation and momentum conservation, and angular momentum conservation, and um, something like charge conservation. But there could be different kinds of charges that we don't have in our universe, and different instead of electrons and protons, there could be different kinds of particles that we don't have. So, so you could you could still think about okay if the bubbles collided, um, it would not be possible for a, a particle or a person from the other universe to come into our universe because there's different particles that are possible. So whatever they're made of doesn't exist in our universe. Um, but it would be possible for there to be energy that gets transferred into our universe. So this collision could produce a whole bunch of radiation that if you got really lucky, you could see somewhere in the sky as some some, some weird feature in the microwave background or something. Uh, yeah. And did the people that look into this, did they also have the basis for whether this one is, you know, you know the bubbles pop in inside of your own universe as well? So yeah, we would get totally annihilated by that bubble. So it would it would basically be expanding very nearly at the speed of light. And so we would be here in this lecture and then bam, it would just be we'd just be wiped out. So a little bit hard to go test for that. Yeah. What would cause the bubble formation? Um it's kind of like a bit random. So it's kind of like when you, like just the, the existence of this other, if you have this other phase or this other possible configuration of things, um, there's something that would be like we call, yeah, it's kind of like a quantum effect. Um, there's something called quantum tunneling where if you have, if you have like a a very thin, um, coil of metal or you know, a particle here, like 
there's just like a probability that something could happen. So, so it's just like you could, there's a calculation that you could do that would tell you the probability that at some point a bubble of a certain size will form. Um, and it's it's just like a random thing that will happen. So it's a, it's a little bit like if you, it's not quite the same thing, but it, like if you start boiling some water, at some point a bubble of steam will form at the bottom of the pot and it'll come up and it's more or less random when that happens and exactly where that happens. So it's a, like the math would be a little bit like that, except it's, it's a probability that we govern that form. Yes. Sorry, I was going to take the drum and keep driving away. Um, so you mentioned that the. I'm totally fine with this, by the way. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so the dark energy can kind of be modeled as an expansion of the separate expansion. So how does this relate? I guess I'm, I'm not confident in quantum field theory at all, but is the separate the dark energy is the separate field from the expansion field or um yeah, yeah, like the you mean the scale factor? Um or so there's there's a right, there's that there's the thing that I call the scale factor, and that's part of the that's like a description of just the geometry of space. It's actually easiest if you imagine like a finite sized universe that, that was like a sphere. Um, we can visualize a 2D sphere, but you could also imagine there's like a, a 3D version of that. And so yeah, so that field A is kind of like the size of the sphere. So it could, it could go. Um, and then also living on that sphere everywhere, there there would be another field that I don't know, sometimes people call it phi. Um, and so then that could separately change with time. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of like the way you should think about that is is very much like that we have electric fields and magnetic fields that could be there or they could or could not be there. And then the electric field could, could change with time as well. It could get stronger or weaker or oscillate. And so also this field could do that. This field would be just a simpler version. It's not a vector like the electric field. It's just we call it a scalar field. Mm -hmm. So um, it's determined by a value that it would have everywhere in space and everywhere in time. And so in the cosmology, it's it's kind of the same throughout space mm -hmm. and then just kind of changing in time. Mm -hmm. and, and then depending on its value, there's a different potential energy for that field. Um, and the energy of that field is the dark energy. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yes. Uh, so that in between the scale of the scale of what did you say is well, yeah, it comes out of the out of the holographic models. Um, this is the one of the interesting things that um, in these models, there's a relation between the fields. So in your gravity theory, you have you have some fields, like the metric and the electromagnetic fields and and maybe these scalar fields. There's a relation between these fields and certain properties of certain quanti physical quantities that exist in the underlying system. So the physical observables of, of this uh, of this two D system. Um, and so, for example, the fact that you have geometry or gravity in this gravity theory is related to the fact that you have energy density. In the um, in the two D theory, so there's some connection between physical quantities over here, fields over here, and physical quantities over here. Um, and so then, typically, there's some other quantity over here, like these these kind of. Um, okay, so these are these these systems. I think I mentioned this word before. Like the, there's special kinds of of materials that would be called. Describe a conformal field theory. So that's a special particular mathematical thing. And then um, uh, these typically have uh, a quantity that implies that we have a scalar field on the other side. So um, so it's kind of a generic thing that you would have not only the gravity field or like the, the space-time geometry, but you would also have something else that is changing at a similar rate that would be um, one of these scalar fields. And so it's, yeah, so it's not really like we're putting it in by hand. It's it's just saying that 
in this kind of setup, you generally will have something like that. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. People considered models with one with scalar fields like uh, for a long time in the past, um, and and one of the complaints about those is that, okay, that just seems like it's put in by hand, and why do you, why does it have these properties that would lead to it varying on cosmological time scales? And so it seems like if you just start with holography as your basic starting point and you ask, well, what typically do you have in the gravity theory? Then you typically have the gravity, but then you also typically seem to have some scalar field, one or more of these scalar fields. And um, so, yeah, it's just like a prediction of the approach. So the right thing is in the holography models, you expect the construct of the holography you also change the time. Or any other fundamental yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, not necessarily. Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think you would say generically those things would not change with time, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about probably the full space of models and, um, yeah, that would probably that would probably be related to some feature that um, would like that could change, but it would cost really a lot of energy, or like it would be unlikely to. There'd be some some physics that says that uh, that quantity is is likely to be constant in time or not very on cosmological time scales. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, so the two-dimensional kind of surface, yeah, integral to two types of surface, stands in very well. Like a three-dimensional, like you think of the things that are in three-dimensional space, would that just completely ruin the whole theory, or would that? Well, like you, you could have a three-dimensional quantum system as your starting point, mm -hmm. and then that could explain some gravitational physics in five, like four space dimensions mm -hmm. and time. So yeah, there are, I mean, it's, it, it's funny the the model of holography that people have most studied because it's best understood is one where it's actually a three dimensional like sphere and then a four dimensional gravity theory. So people have, Written lots and lots of papers about this four dimensional gravity theory that's obviously totally unreflectic, but, um, but it's the one where we best understand the, the equations. Um, and even there's another one that's even simpler that I can that I can write down that's actually just an ordinary quantum mechanical system, just like almost like a bunch of harmonic oscillators uh, and some spins, and, and I can write down exactly the Hamiltonian for you. Um, and so that one describes like a 10 dimensional gravitational universe. Um, again, it's not very realistic. But if you wanted to study a big 10 dimensional, big black hole in that 10 dimensional universe, then you could just do it using these, using these equations. And people are, have been simulating those ones on like supercomputers in Japan um, to understand the gravitational physics in, in this weird 10 dimensional universe. Yeah. With the holographic model, is there like supposed to be nothing outside of it, or is it within another one? Within another one yeah, there's, I mean, you know, the, with a holographic model, it's simpler. Like you just have this one system, and and you know, I draw it. I kind of draw it as a two D sphere, and it kind of looks like there's three D space around that. But there's you're not really supposed to think of there being any physical meaning to that 3D space around it. So it's just like intrinsically a two-dimensional system um, and it has some quantum state and then it evolves with time. And so it's really quite simple, like mathematically, it's very similar to how you would describe just a, a sphere of, of copper or something, um, like a thin film or an old foil or something like that. So it's just mostly super thin and it's worried about the two-dimensional aspect of it. So that's what, like one of the things I like a lot about it is that it's just very simple, um, like in terms of the types of physical systems that people 
understand pretty well how to describe. This is just like an example of one of those. So it's not very similar. It's ordinary quantum mechanics, and um, and then if if it's true that like the gravitational physics gets conversion from that, um, then I mean that's ideal because we already really know how to do the physics of those systems, and then also just to understand uh, how to go back and forth. Yeah. All right, you all win. <laughs> uh, any last questions? Yeah, Eddie. Yeah, okay. So this is like, um, this is a question about a slightly different kind of wormhole. Let me say a, a, a bit about so yeah, I was I was drawing. This wormhole in imaginary time um, is is what's relevant to this cosmological cosmology story. Um, and so like, like most things in general relativity, it's simplest to picture what a wormhole is if you just think about 2D space. And so in 2D space, yeah, so we talked about how space could be curved. And so a wormhole is just something where the space is very curved, kind of like a black hole. Um, but then, the black hole, it would, it would actually join up with another part of space or possibly an entirely separate universe that's only joined by the wormhole. So there's two, so people talk about it. You could, you could have a wormhole, let me draw like this. So you could have a wormhole bet between two parts of our universe like that, and that would be like a shortcut between two parts where you could go the regular way. And, and so if, you, if you're here, like you would see something that looks like a black hole. And also someone over here would see something that looks like a black hole. And and then um, you know if, if they if they both jumped into the black hole, um, they would be able to meet each other inside. Um, and, and so when I say you could have a wormhole, I mean that you can solve Einstein's equations and um, like this is a solution. So we don't know that, we don't think that there's probably any wormholes in our universe and it would not be possible as far as we know to, to build one, but is it a physically consistent thing? Um, well, according to the Einstein's equations, you could have, you could have a, a wormhole. Um, the main problem with those, so the, the usual solutions when you, when you solve the equations, you have a wormhole. Um, Generally, those wormholes are not static. So one of the main problems with one of, with these wormholes um, is that gravity wants to make them kind of stretch out and, and kind of collapse. So, so as time passes, if, if you go into that wormhole, um, as time passes, it kind of gets thinner and thinner and it gets longer and longer. And so if you were to, the, the wormholes that were most sure uh, could theoretically exist, if you were to try to go in, um, you could only get like halfway through the wormhole before it pinched off and sort of collapsed around you and then you would get squished. Um, so the good news is that you'd be able to meet up with this other person. So if, I don't know, these, these two people have been somehow communicating uh, long distances through radio waves across space this way. Okay. Um, and then they agreed, okay, we're gonna like, let's let's meet each other inside the wormhole. Um, so it, it is possible that they could meet up before the wormhole collapsed. And they, could, they could jump in and then they could get to the middle. Um, and for, for these, like more ordinary wormholes that we know about, then they, they could meet and then the whole thing would collapse. Um, but they wouldn't have time 
to get out the other side. So this person could have jumped through and then end up over there. So then there's like a debate in, in physics about whether those kind of wormholes could exist. Those are called ones that you could get through to the other side are called traversable wormholes. Um, and what people have proven is that in order to have a tra traversable wormhole, um, you need to have negative energy, which again, like it sounds like we're just making this stuff up, but it's mathematically something like you could, in, in the equation, there's some energy density. And then, you know, if you allow yourself that to be only positive, then you can only go wormholes that you can't get through. But if you just allowed in the equation to have the energy density to be negative, then you can find a solution to the equations where you could get through the wormhole. Um, and so there, um, people realize that with quantum mechanics, sometimes it is possible to have negative energies. And so like the current understanding is that even these traversable wormholes are not completely ruled out. Um, that it seems like maybe you could, you could have some weird quantum state of, of fields in here and then that could support one of these wormholes that you could jump through. Okay. And so then I think your question is, um, suppose you were to encounter a sign somewhere in the universe that said traversable wormhole. And, and then, you know, if you jump into the traversable wormhole, um, like, could you just end up anywhere in the universe and it's like random, or is there a specific place you're going to end up? Uh, well, there's, there's a specific place that you would end up. So, so if, if there were a traversable wormhole, um, then like one side would be located at, at a specific location, then it would actually just look something like a black hole. Things could be orbiting around it. And then the other side would also be at some specific place, either in your own universe or in some other universe. And so you wouldn't really have a choice. Um, you don't get to like make a wish and then you end up at that place. Well, I'm like, probably none of these actually exist in the universe. Um, if you had some super powerful I mean, okay, if if you had if you had one of these CFTs, one of these holographic 2D things, and if instead of there being nothing outside of that, maybe if that thing were actually sitting in some in someone's lab in another universe, okay, so that's possible. Like a ball of copper could just could be someone's lab. And if, if someone was able to manipulate the entanglement of that thing in their lab, um, then maybe they could set up a space time that would have a wormhole between points that they choose. So like, I don't know, they could like, you could imagine that if someone actually could control things, then they, they could add wormholes wherever they want. Um, but they would still have to choose which two places are connected by the wormhole. You can't have a wormhole that you go in one side and then it's like connected to everything. Or I don't know, maybe, okay, like maybe maybe there's multiple branching. I don't, I don't know that it's impossible to have, possibly there are some solutions with one, in, one entrance and multiple exits, but I don't think anyone's written, like actually found a solution. People write paper, people write like scientific papers about these wormholes and, and publish them. So it's it's like actually an active area of theoretical research. Some people are just wanting to know, is it physically possible within our, our models of, of quantum gravity? Yeah. So um, when I looked at this image, I kind of noticed that it looks like in the, <clears throat> sorry, from a still reference frame uh, to empty space, that the time from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch would just be a constant. But then I, I'm thinking about how, um, I don't know anything about general relativity, but in special relativity, um, time differs between reference frames. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that the time between the Big Bang and the Big Crunch is 
literally just shorter in some reference frames, or is there some kind of mitigation effect that the universe has to? Yeah, um, if you were, if you were here and you started zipping around close to the speed of light, you really wanted to experience the big crunch in your lifetime, then you could indeed make use of special relativity, build your relativistic spaceship, get up to close to the speed of light, and then you know wait a couple of years and then you hit the big crunch. So okay. yeah, so you you could definitely do that uh, depending on your your velocity through the space. All right. Yeah. And then just kind of one more follow up from that. This one might be a little bit like assuming too many things. Okay. But I'm trying. Um, I'm currently I'm imagining that this shape right here that we see is a uh, 4D kind of hyper ellipse of. Uh, the progression of our universe. So it's kind of like a sphere and it starts expanding and then it contracts. Again. Yeah, I mean, it can also just be an infinite plane that gets like stretched out and then squished. But yeah, it's, it's fine to also think about it as like a, a big 3D sphere that stretches out and squishes. Okay. But the thing I'm noticing or I'm thinking about is um, if I'm correct, um, Time passes differently when you're under different gravitational effects. Is this so? Uh, yeah. Th well, there's there's an, the gravitational time dilation thing as well. That I mean, if you were if there's a black hole, and that's the other thing. Um, if you were to go really close to the black hole in the middle of our galaxy, then you could also shortcut like it. It, it would be passing slower for you close to that and so you would experience the big crunch sooner by doing that as well okay but um then would that mean that you would perceive the geometry of the rest of space time differently under a given um, gravitational force within just one three in space so so like if you're close to there, there's like this a, a, a fixed total geometry of the 4D space. Um, yeah. So there's like you could just draw that and then you could imagine different paths in that geometry. And for each path, there would be a certain time that you would experience. Um, and I mean things would look different just because you're moving or not moving, or depending on your depending on your trajectory, you would see stuff around you seem to be moving relative to you or not relative. Maybe uh, like Astro Club execs uh, should feel to feel free to take off. I, I feel bad like you got more than you bargained for. Uh, okay, and, yeah, of course anyone should. Yeah, um, if you were somewhat able to copy uh, an instance of the CMT, an yeah. instant, would that create another like another universe? Yeah, I mean, if if you had two of those spheres, okay, well, yeah, so. Yeah, actually, one of one of my most uh, cited papers is about this thing. So suppose you had two of these DFTs, and and let's say okay, maybe they're both in in the low temperature state, and then it would be like you had two separate universes. Okay, but now um, if you actually entangle these two things in a certain way, so so in quantum mechanics, you could take any two systems and then you can entangle those systems. Okay, and and so I can write down some there's some special quantum state of these two systems that are. This one looks like some hot, like thermal state. Okay, so remember I said you heat up a thing and then it looks like a black hole. And then um, in, in thermodynamics, of, like if you, if you if you study thermodynamics, there's often the notion of a heat bath where you have like your system that you're interested in, 
and then it's interacting with some other system outside of it that would like a, like a water bath or something. Um, um, quantum mechanically, we we have when you have a heat bath, we have like a system that's that's at some temperature, and then it's like maintaining it, maintaining its temperature because of the interactions uh, with the rest. Then actually, there's a lot of entanglement that's generated between your system and the the other system. Okay. So there's there's a natural kind of state to consider where you think of this CFT as being like the heat bath to the other one. So you have so this one is at some temperature and this one is at some temperature. But then there's there's all this entanglement um, that you would have between them. Um, and and so this kind of state where you have two hot CFTs and but then they're entangled in this natural way. Each of those encodes a universe with a black hole. And then these black holes are connected behind their horizons by a wormhole. So, so yeah, you could, um, it's a, like a really interesting thought experiment that you could start with two separate, two separate CFTs. They would encode these two separate universes, but then just by entangling the CFTs in quantum entanglement state, then those universes would end up getting connected geometrically um, by one of these wormholes. So that was actually, yeah, that was actually like one of the things I was thinking about uh, uh, like really early on when people were, were starting to understand the connection between entanglement and how space might emerge from entanglement. This is like the example that, uh, that was, was kind of inspired. This was, this was, Discussed by so there's a guy named Juan Molesina, and he's a he's a physicist that came from Argentina and then um, did graduate school in the United States and now he's still uh, he's a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study where where Oppenheimer was in the movie if you've seen it um, so and where Einstein was at the end of his career so so Molesina is the guy that came up with this holographic quantum gravity originally, he proposed it. And he also came up with this idea of thinking about two copies of the holographic system and entangling them. Yeah. But the other day, I finished reading a sci-fi novel. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, okay, last question, last question maybe. How about three hours? Okay, yeah, so this is like there's there's two concepts that get mixed up a lot in in popular science and in sci-fi. Um and so one of them is this many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that we experience something, but then mathematically, if you think about the whole universe, then it's possible that the wave, there's a wave function for everything that includes different possible things that we could be experiencing. Um, so that it's possible that really in the complete description of everything, there's a superposition of possibilities, and we're only experiencing one of those possibilities. Okay, so that's the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay. And then separately, there's this bubble thing, which is known as the multiverse. And that would be saying that there's like just different parts of the universe that would maybe have different physics in them. And they would kind of be coexisting at the same time um, in just in different regions of space. Okay. And like maybe if it's infinite, maybe there's another universe that's similar to our universe that has a Spider-Man that's slightly different than our Spider-Man. Okay. So I think um, in terms of popular culture, um, the, the animated Spider-Man films recently are, I think, invoking this multiverse picture with the different bubbles. Um, everything everywhere all at once, I believe 
was invoking this other notion of, of the many worlds and maybe the idea that those different parts of the wave function could interact with them. Um, but so, yeah, sometimes it's like, can, can you, it's just mixed up how, how both of those things come together. But you, yeah, by making an app, by, by making a choice, you know, that would, that would be sending you to one of some part, like a different part of the wave function, your, the, the future of your wave function would be affected. You would, you would end up in a, a, a different part of the whole wave function. Um, so that's many worlds. You wouldn't end up in some distant multi uh, Yeah. So, all right. So I think that'll, I think that's a good place to, to end things. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the questions. That was really fun. Yeah.